Well, good morning, friends. Father Frank Pavone here, National Director of Priests for Life, coming to you from the United States Supreme Court. My team and I just arrived here in Washington. We'll be here today and tomorrow for an entire series of prayer rallies, uh, educational sessions, press conferences, more prayer rallies here in front of the court. The oral arguments will take place tomorrow in one of the most important cases that the Supreme Court has heard in years. This is the first case dealing explicitly with abortion in four years. Back in 2016, the, case, the court heard the case of Whole Women's Health versus Hellerstead. That was a case actually very similar to the one that it is it has accepted this year and is hearing arguments on tomorrow. And we will explain the similarities as well as the differences. But we're going to be accompanying you and let you accompany us throughout these two days. You will be able to join us in prayer. You'll be able to hear from various experts connected to this case. You'll be able to understand the context for this case, namely the damage that the abortion industry, unregulated and unscrupulous as it is, continues to, 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 to do to women uh, and families all across the nation, not to mention to the babies that they kill. You will be able to uh, understand better what the court is actually hearing in the arguments and what they will actually be deciding and how, f how far that can take us down the road of restoring protection to the unborn, how far that can take us down the road to ultimately doing away with Roe versus Wade, the most destructive the most erroneous, the most unjust uh, decision that not only this Supreme Court, but any court at any time in human history has ever made. So we're here in Washington, D.C. We expect to be joined from people by uh, people from all over the country, uh, and you'll know many of them, various pro-life leaders uh, will be with us. We will be joined by various members of Congress, uh, both the House and the Senate. Uh, we will be joined by a lot of people during these two days, and you'll be hearing from many of them, not only as they speak, but as we interview them uh, directly uh, for you to understand more about this case. Uh, so let's, uh, let's begin here uh, as you join us, turning to the Lord in prayer as we stand before this court. Father, we know that the most unjust of discriminations is abortion. We know as we stand in front of this building which bears the words equal justice under law that there is no greater injustice than abortion. That the decision that came from this court has unleashed a wave of violence unlike anything we have ever seen, resulting in our nation alone in some 61 million children being destroyed and countless many more, tens of millions of moms, dads, grandparents, siblings, and other family members wounded by this devastating violence. We come here, Lord, today in prayer for our nation, and specifically for this court, as it hears yet another case in the long line of dozens of cases in which it has ruled on abortion since Roe v. Wade in 1973. Let this case, whose arguments are heard tomorrow, bring us closer to the day when abortion will be a sad memory of the past and the unborn will again be recognized and protected in our nation's laws and in our culture. Father, give wisdom to the justices and their clerks. Give wisdom to the attorneys arguing this case. Thank you for all the pro-life groups and individuals who have issued and submitted to the court friend of the court briefs outlining the various arguments in this case. And we ask you, Lord, a particular blessing on our legislators, not only here in Washington, but throughout the states who have taken the steps they need to take to protect moms, dads, and children from the violence of an unscrupulous, unregulated abortion industry. Be with us and let your people bear witness, Lord, to the truth, to the sanctity of life. We pray through Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, brothers and sisters, this case originates in Louisiana, where uh, a law was passed to protect moms from an unscrupulous, unregulated abortion industry. And one of the ways in which 
not only Louisiana, but various states have attempted to protect the health of women going to get abortions is to put requirements on the abortionists. They claim to be health care providers. They claim to be serving these women. And so a key strategy in our movement has been to say to the abortion industry, if you claim to be health care, then live up to the standards of health care. If you claim to be a doctor offering a medical procedure, then submit to the same standards that other doctors have to adhere to as they administer other medical procedures. Our contention, of course, is that abortion is not medicine in the first place. And we'll be talking a lot about that during these days. Our contention, furthermore, is that there is no such thing as a safe abortion. No matter how many laws are passed, nothing can make it safe simply because it's so unnatural and certainly nothing can make it right. But nevertheless, while abortion is and has been unleashed in our country in a totally uh, unregulated way, there are things we can do to protect the health and safety of the women who go to these clinics. And one of those measures that Louisiana has passed through its elected representatives and its governor is to require that these abortionists have hospital admitting privileges in facilities uh, in, at hospitals near their facility. Now this was not something that Louisiana came up with in order to apply just to the abortionist. This was something already in place in Louisiana law for ambulatory surgical centers. It was already a requirement that the doctors and their staff in these ambulatory surgical centers have hospital admitting privileges in nearby hospitals. You can easily conclude why that's important. Not only for the continuity of care, if there's a medical emergency that requires hospitalization, that this patient be taken immediately by ambulance to the hospital and that the the physician accompany her who knows what was just done to her who presumably would know something about her medical condition although sadly in the abortion industry we can't take that for granted either there's also questions of certification qualification uh, competency if you have to have uh, hospital admitting privileges while well, the hospitals have more rigorous standards for granting those privileges than do the abortion facilities for letting them come in to do the procedures. This is the case in Louisiana and this is the case that the abortion industry complained about and challenged in court. Challenged in the district court, it was appealed to the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals which upheld the law and then the abortion industry brought it here to the Supreme Court. There are other issues involved in this case, which we will discuss. But right now, I'm joined by some people here from Louisiana. And um, Alex, are you ready to chat with us? This is Alex Sagers, who is the Director of Education for Louisiana Right to Life. I have known her for years. We've been together at various conferences and other pro-life events. Now we're together at the U.S. Supreme Court, and yes. Louisiana is front and center. Although, of course, this case really impacts the entire nation but tell us a little bit about uh, what it feels like to be here for uh, defending a law from your own home state you know especially today as a Louisiana woman I am so proud to be here in support of so many Louisiana women who have been harmed by the for-profit abortion industry in Louisiana I mean this law started in our office you know whenever we started hearing all of these stories happen from various women throughout Louisiana and beyond and whenever we start hearing these stories of women who feel like they've been treated you know like cattle mm -hmm. or that mm -hmm. the abortionists didn't even have a relationship with them, you know, that they were just told to get up and get out. Um, of course, we started investigating. Of course, then we opened up, you know, the public health records and we see numerous violations for years that are just disgusting, the disgusting conditions in the clinics, you know, using single-use IV fluids more than once, um, the unreported, you know, unreporting of uh, statutory rape of, you know, of minors, just so many things that just pile and pile and pile on that don't even have really real consequences to it. So then we looked at our Louisiana law and we're like, okay, how can we try to start getting them to even abide by a lick of health and safety standards? And of course, we saw that outpatient surgical centers all throughout Louisiana require admitting privileges. Yeah, and, and let me and let me interject here because of course I just made this point with them, and I want to highlight it again as you're as you're speaking about it. 
this was not something Louisiana imposed just on abortionists. Of course not. And, and, and letting all the rest of the the health profession go go free. This was already in place. So how yes. come the abortion facilities did not have this requirement if the other surgical centers did? There's simply a loophole for abortion clinics. They're not held to the same standards as other outpatient surgical it's, centers. It's the abortion distortion, isn't it? it that's as exactly it. You know, yeah. any other health issue is never just fought for unfettered access like this. Any other health issue that people try to get and have access to, we make sure we have regulations. We make sure it's safe for exactly, people who walk in, exactly. but because it's so politicized and because clearly this is a for-profit driven uh, case, I mean, they're, you know, just, it, it's like a, blind, a blinding spotlight on what's really happening with the abortion industry in Louisiana. And, and let's look at that a little more. But by the way, I just want to emphasize something you said right at the outset. Yeah. This law that, that is now being examined by this Supreme Court originated in your office, That's you right. said. Yes. Louisiana right to life. Yes, it originated in our office, you know, as we hear these testimonies of women, and we brought this to Katrina Jackson, Representative Katrina yes, Jackson, yes, yes. who is just an amazing example of an empowered woman who empowers women. Now, she's a pro-life Democrat. She's a pro-life uh, uh, African-American woman Democrat, and she is just the best. A rare breed, unfortunately, when it comes to Democrats these days. Louisiana but, is a rare breed. But Louisiana, <laughs> well, you have a pro-life Democrat governor, too. That's, that's exactly uh, right. right. Yeah. Was he the one that signed this law? Oh, yeah. Yeah, he ha is, has been in support of every single pro-life law that's come through Louisiana. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, so Alex, uh, let, 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 let's look at this a little bit more. You know, you mentioned a point how the abortion industry, it's unregulated. I mean, this procedure by this court was allowed throughout pregnancy. And because it came about through a court decision, it didn't have the benefit, did it, of the legislative process where you have hearings, you have amendments, you have the gathering of all kinds of evidence. In other words, it's a, a more slow, deliberate information gathering, fact finding process that allows for the voice of the people to shape whatever law is being considered. And yet the, the availability of abortion as a procedure was just sort of dumped on the nation by this court and yes in Roe versus Wade it says well you know the states can make sure that this is done in a way that maximizes the safety of the women and the physicians are responsible to you know do this in a safe way but all that is is an exhortation it's not a policy and the states even had to fight for putting any kinds of protection for the women you know in in their states yeah um, no, the Supreme Court for so long is, has been basically the National Abortion Medical Board. Yeah, right. let's talk about that too, because yeah. is there any other medical procedure, either before uh, uh, Roe v. Wade was handed down or since, is there any other medical procedure that when a state, knowing the situation in their own state, sees that there's a need for some kind of regulation or, 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 or uh, qualification by the doctors or, or, or standard by the clinics, that gets adjudicated in the courts all the way up to the Supreme Court. Is there any other medical procedure that's treated this way? To my knowledge, no. It makes sense that states protect their citizens. And Louisiana is actually you're 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 rated number one this year by Americans United for Life as they do the rankings of the various states as far as how protective the state is of both the unborn and the mom and the family. Uh, so congratulations on that. Thank you. Yeah, we're so we're we're proud to stand for unborn babies and their mothers in the state of Louisiana. Absolutely, we're proud of all of our clinics. We're proud of the marches for life that happen all throughout Louisiana, and we're especially proud of. Um, pursuing the end of abortion all throughout Louisiana, especially with our Love Life Amendment that's happening this year. And tell me about that. Yeah, so the Love Life Amendment this year um, is an amendment that's going to be on the ballot uh, in November. It's, uh, it says that it ensures that there is no right to abortion or the taxpayer funding of abortion in our state constitution so that once Roe versus Wade is overturned, we'll be able to protect all of our pro-life laws in Louisiana, stepping ahead of the game, making sure that a Roe versus Wade doesn't happen in our own mm. home state. Mm. Now, um, we are here in front of this court. They're going to hear the arguments tomorrow, but it's not just about what was is going to be said tomorrow. Uh, there have been dozens of briefs submitted to this court. I know one of them came from the Louisiana legislators themselves, and of course, Louisiana Right to Life. Um, one of them came from us, from Priests for Life. Uh, one of them came from that building across the street there, as 207 members of the Senate and the House uh, signed on to a brief, all in support of Louisiana's law. I think the total is 42 different friend of the court briefs. And each of these documents, as you know, develops a, a different argument, you know, in favor 
of the law of Louisiana. And we see, uh, again, as you've explained, that, I mean, so many violations. Let's just focus on that for another moment. I understand right now there are three abortion facilities in the state of Louisiana. Is that right? That's right. In Shreveport, in Baton Rouge, and New Orleans. In New Orleans. And this case specifically comes out of the, the, the clinic that is in Shreveport, right? Yes, that's the June right. Medical Services, which also strangely goes by the name of Hope, doesn't it? Yes, it does. That you know, that's such a strange name, along with you know, I mean, Whole Woman's Health. That was in in tech. These people that say that they, you know, that they have health for these women throughout all various stages of women's health care, and it's just such again an abortion distortion. <laughs> I mean, hope. I mean, people don't go to the abortion clinic because of hope. They go there because of despair. It's just right. the opposite. Out right? of that situation of crisis. Exactly. Um, and you started uh, uh, mentioning some of the violations that you have seen right there on the ground in Louisiana. You know. One of the arguments we're making to this court is, essentially, back off. The legislators of Louisiana, elected by the people of Louisiana, and their governor, also elected by the people, they know best what Louisiana women need. They know best what Louisiana doctors should be required to do. Back off and let them govern. Isn't that one? Of, and, and, and because you know on the ground there, the various atrocities that have occurred. Tell us in a little bit more detail what some of those, uh, those atrocities are that led the legislators to conclude, hey, we've got a bad situation on our hands and we need to address it. Yeah, well, actually something I want to say that's interesting is, um, you know, of course, all the different um, reproductive rights groups, the abortion advocacy groups have come together and they're rallying for this case. They're doing different events. And something that they said in one of their meetings um, is that, oh, they're just, you know, they say that abortion clinics have violations. They, it's really just because they used um, uh, what out-of-date hand sanitizer. And that is such, oh, for that's sake. such a blatant lie. These records are you know they're they're clear they're open they're public they're years and years of stuff that you can actually see for yourself you know we just we did the request we'll give them to you you can see all of that and it's amazing to me personally i consider myself a feminist and it's amazing to me how this kind of law just because it was put forth by a pro life person that they would be fighting against it when really this is an issue that should be politics aside we should be on the same side of this. If you care for women, you should be caring about admitting privileges. If you care for women, you should be caring about upholding basic common health and safety standards for women in our own backyard of Louisiana. You know, Americans United for Life, uh, another one of our uh, our, our colleagues uh, in big groups in the pro-life movement, did a report called Unsafe, which you're familiar with. From 2008 to 2016, they looked at abortion facilities in 32 states. They outlined 10 different categories of violations. Uh, untrained medical staff, yes. lack of emergency medical equipment, unsanitary conditions of all kinds, failure to properly monitor patients' vital signs, and on and on it goes. Mm -hmm. Louisiana's abortion facilities, and as you mentioned, there are currently three of them operating, were, showed up in nine of those ten categories of violations. They, they, they were all over the place, all over the map. And um, for people to say, oh yeah, this is just because of hand sanitizers. Well, first of all, if you're running a clinic, you ought to be able to keep your, your hand sanitizers up to up to date, and you should have yes. them too. Not all of them even have them. But okay. but for goodness sake, that's that's uh, you know uh, the tip of the iceberg as right. far as the, the violations that have occurred. You know, and they say we don't even need this law because emergencies don't happen. They say that it's such a small percentage of women that have to go to the to the ER that this is an unnecessary law. Well, I say tell that to the woman who had to go to the ER That's last right. March. Last March, there was a woman who um, started hemorrhaging, and they didn't even have the emergency kit, the emergency supplies on hand to stop her bleeding. They didn't even they, have them. So she, I mean, she went to the ER. She ended up having to have an emergency hysterectomy because of all of the delays in care and the amount of blood that she lost. And that's incredible. So tell that to that woman. Tell that woman that we don't need regulations on the abortion industry. It doesn't have to happen to many. It just has to happen to one. Right, right, exactly. We could talk about this forever, but mm -hmm. uh, uh, I see the, you know, you're the Lu education director at Louisiana Right to Life. And the person holding the umbrella over you <laughs> is the executive director. So you always get this treatment? <laughs> My leader with a servant's heart. This is Louisiana style. <laughs> ben, you want to come in on the on the camera for a moment? We've yeah, entered. We <laughs> Can we get, do we have both of them I in the shot here? 
Uh, this is Ben Clapper, friends. We've interviewed Ben already on this uh, series of educational um, programs about this very important case. And Ben, it's great to be with you here today. Uh, great to be with you, Father Frank. It's a, you know, w what a great opportunity we have to shift the direction of the Supreme Court behind us, and and to be at the center of this. It's a, it's exciting, and we just put it in the Lord's hands at this point. We do indeed. Alex is just giving us a great summary of uh, one side of this case, which is okay. Louisiana has acted to protect the health and safety of women. They know best. The court should back off. Let these regulations stand, etc. There's another aspect to this case, though, that Louisiana initiated That's right. that is very, very interesting and can be very impactful yeah. on the whole country. Right. Explain to us what that is. Yeah, you know, so as this case was coming up, you know, the Louisiana Attorney General's Office really felt that these abortion facilities, these are for-profit businesses, and they shouldn't be able to use what's called third-party standing to argue and fight against these laws. So they are saying that you know they are representing women in Louisiana. Of course, it's not a specific woman that they're representing. It's just theoretical women. And this has been happening really for decades now where abortion businesses go to court and they say they represent women. And when, of course, they have a for-profit interest in the opposite, right? I mean, they are fighting against the very laws that are supposed to help these women that they're supposedly representing. So Louisiana did a cross petition to the Supreme Court and said, well, if you're going to hear this case, then you need to look at whether abortion facilities even have the ability to rep use third party. Mm -hmm. And it really came out of Justice Thomas's dissent in the Hellerstadt case when he initiated it, when he questioned whether there was a third party use, because third party under law says that you have to have a close relationship with the party that you're representing. Well, we're going to have a woman testifying tomorrow at this rally who says she went into that June Medical Hope abortion facility and the only time she saw the physician was right at the abortion. So obviously there's no doctor-patient relationship. There's no close relationship with these women. So they should not be able to claim this third-party standing. And if the Supreme Court agrees with Louisiana, even if the Supreme Court doesn't agree with us on the admitting privilege side of this mm -hmm. argument, because there's really two separate questions now, the admitting privileges and the third-party standing, if they side with us on third-party standing, it could throw out lawsuits across the country where abortion businesses are fighting against the laws that are supposed to protect women. Look, we need to put these patients, these women, over the profits of the abortion facility. If they want to sue, tell women to come sue our laws. And, 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 that's, and that's the point I was going to get to here. In this case, is there a single woman who either sought or had an abortion in Louisiana who signed on to this case and Absolutely brought this case? Absolutely not. Not a single one. They didn't even try. They didn't even try because for decades, the Supreme Court has given them a pass. You know? I mean, they've had... Uh, I mean, this has been like the abortion protection agency for the past 20 years. Right? And they said, well, abortion businesses, you basically come and you don't have to represent women. You just say this is bad for us and they're going to protect them. Well, it's time for the Supreme Court to change that. Right? If women want to sue against these laws then it's time for them to bring their lawsuits forward. And so abortion facilities aren't going to be the ones handling it in the future. That's our hope. How do the two of you feel? I mean, the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals upheld this law in a very, very vigorous way. Uh, the decision is very, very well argued and worded. How do you feel about what's going to happen here over the next few months? Of course, the arguments will be tomorrow. We won't get a decision till the end of June. But are you and the other Louisiana folks feeling good about the outcome? Well, I'm sure you know this, Father Frank. Trying to, trying to project what the Supreme Court is going to do is, uh, you know, I, look, I, I'm trying not to make a guess and get my hopes up right. or my hopes down. You know, I'd rather just let the decision come out and and be surprised one way or the other. Look, I mean, on the third party standing, I'm cautiously optimistic. You know, it took four justices to accept that cross petition. So really, only you need one more justice. You know, so it really kind of you know hinges on Kavanaugh. Gorsuch and Roberts, you know, they're the swings right now because we don't really know Gorsuch and Kavanaugh have yet to really, on the issue of abortion, give us a solid decision yet. So we just don't know. After we found out in the early 90s, you know, justices that we don't know about can make decisions that we're not we're surprised about. So you know, we really don't know. 
Uh, I just I just really hope that this court examines what the court is supposed to be. This is not supposed to be, as Alex was saying, the National Abortion Board, the Medical Board. This isn't supposed to be the Abortion Protection Agency, right? This shouldn't protect abortion businesses. If women want to file suit themselves, that's another matter, and let the Supreme Court uh, handle that at that time. But for today and for this issue, abortion businesses shouldn't be given a loophole when it comes to health and safety protections. It makes no sense. As Alex said, every other outpatient surgical facility in Louisiana has to have privileges. Why in the world should abortion be exempt for that? I mean, it just it doesn't make sense. And, and hopefully and the Supreme Court makes sense. So. Hopefully they see that. And, you know, there's a big. this is one of the big differences between this case and the similar case four years ago. Because right. out of Texas, they took this law and they imposed this requirement on the abortionist. Now, I think they still should have. Sure. But it was not in place for the other doctors in the state. Louisiana, you have a situation where they were just bringing the abortion facilities up to the same standards as the rest of them. The other big difference, of course, is the number of abortion facilities. As we were discussing, there are three operating now in the entire state. And that's three too many, of course. But you guys are doing a great job in, 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 in exposing these mills, getting them closed. But in Texas, there were dozens of them. And, 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 and so the court was looking at a different, uh, a different calculus. Uh, uh, in terms of this law, so and that, that's reason for optimism as well. I think the I think the um, the way this case is constructed, it really has a lot of better, specific, hardcore evidence yeah. than the Hellerstead case. Well, I'm, can I ask you what do you what do you have a feeling about what's going to happen? I I feel uh, just as you said, cautiously optimistic. There's no way to tell what the Supreme Court is going to do on any given day. Uh, so there really is nobody. Even I mean, the folks will come out of here tomorrow, friends, and they'll share with us. The lawyers will share with us their impressions, and they can get some pretty educated. They can make some pretty educated guesses based on how the questioning goes and and what the justices seem to be concerned about. But in the end, it's impossible to tell. Um, but I, I think there's some really good reasons for confidence. Yeah. yeah. And in the meantime, we're gonna in Louisiana, we're gonna hold feet to the fire, and we're gonna make sure that Louisiana women's voices are heard. The Louisiana women's voices will be heard here today and also tomorrow. And and we, uh, as you know, through our, our Rachel's Vineyard retreat program, healing people from abortion all over the world, uh, and our Silent No More campaign, which is represented here today. So important, uh, so important for this, right? The voices of these women need to be heard, and, um, and they are being heard. And we have so many from Louisiana who are speaking up. So God bless you both. You, ben Bob. Clapper, Executive God Director, Louisiana Right to Life. Alex Sagers, Education. Director, thank you both. Thanks, thank Father Frank. You. Thank you so much. Okay, friends, we're going to stay with you now, and uh, we're going to have um, uh, you join us in a time of prayer. As you can see, we're um, we're gathered here. There's two rallies going on here simultaneously, and this is often the the scene at the Supreme Court because right now arguments are being heard in other cases uh, unrelated to, to to ours, and so we have some folks over here that are are, are exercising their uh, their own First Amendment right to uh, to gather and to uh, and to express their views. So we have this uh, this case going on in the court right now, rally right next to us. But but we're uh, we're, uh, we're 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 making out okay here. We have our own speakers here. We're going to do some time of prayer uh, and of testimony and of witness. A little bit of light rain coming down right now, and um, but nothing uh, nothing really problematic. And so you're going to see our signs here. Uh, maybe, Rob, we can bring the camera this way. And uh, you'll see our signs here. I regret my abortion and silent no more. Let's go over here. So, friends, we have uh, created our own sign here that says the abortion industry exploits women. And you heard uh, Alex give us a, a very good, uh, uh, troubling but good summary of that. And then, of course, I regret my abortion uh, is this main sign of the Silent No More campaign. And those that have had this procedure who know best what this is about uh, hold these signs all over the country, all around the world. And uh, so we're going to um, uh, hear from some of those women today, including from the state of Louisiana. And we're going to get uh, underway here in just a little bit. So we'll let you just uh, look at the scene here for a few moments and begin praying there in your own homes uh, or wherever you may be. Join us now for this time of prayer. 
for victory in this case. something to what we're live broadcasting uh, okay friends um, <laughs> okay Cindy Collins is here uh, she is she's going to tell you a little bit about herself but she's from Louisiana she's involved with our silent no more campaign and our friend and colleague Alan Parker who's uh, uh, helped to uh, organize this time of prayer here today he heads up the Justice Foundation and also associated with that operation outcry which like silent no more gives voice uh, to these uh, moms who were harmed by abortion. How do the two of you feel here today as this court gets ready to hear this case? Well, I am very excited, Father Frank, because in 2014 I testified representing the thousands of women in Louisiana, like myself, that have been injured by abortion. And the voices of women need to speak out. We cannot be silenced any longer. The abortion industry does not represent us. They didn't represent me or even care about me when I was left hemorrhaging, told to get up and get out, and left bleeding outside of an abortion facility. And the thing is, is that nothing's changed. You know, that's been 47 years ago, but I'm still counseling women that are still going through that today. So we have to stand up as Americans to stop this atrocity of the shedding of innocent blood, but also what's happening to women. So I just really want to encourage those that are watching, if you have had an abortion, there's healing through Priests for Life, Rachel's Vineyard, and then you can be a voice through Silent No More Awareness and Operation Outcry. It's time for healing and for our voices to be heard. This must be uh, uh, so, um, I don't know what the word is, so significant certainly, so moving for you because as we were just discussing with our friends from Louisiana Right to Life, not a single woman from Louisiana or from anywhere else who has had an abortion or tried to get an abortion has come before this court in this case saying we don't need this law in Louisiana. Not a single one. The abortionists have come. The business that these women have to pay has come and said we don't want these regulations. We don't want these restrictions. We don't want these measures that the duly elected lawmakers of Louisiana have said are appropriate for protecting the health of, 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 of women. And here you are, I mean, you're someone who could have come to the court and said, you know what, I had an abortion in Louisiana and we don't need this law. But you're saying just the opposite. We do need protections, not only for the babies, for the mothers and the innocent blood, as you say, that has been shed. It's the blood of the babies and it's the blood of their moms. It's your blood that was shed. Amen. And that's so true because the abortionists do not speak for us. There was no doctor-patient relationship, and all that I saw was the eyes over a mask and a voice behind that mask, and he was out of there. He's not, it wasn't a doctor, it's an abortionist and a practitioner. You know, actually my abortion was in Washington, D.C., the first one that I had, and then subsequently I went into a downward spiral. But Father Frank, I mean now, I count, I've counseled hundreds and I've listened to thousands of women tell their stories. Nothing Nothing has changed. Women are still being hurt, they're being injured, and they're told to be silent like I was told to get up and get out, keep quiet, or they're bound in shame. So it's time, you know, that's why I'm compelled. My voice has to speak for the other women. And these abortionists in Louisiana, they do not speak for us, and they can't get away with this that's now. Right. That's right. That's right. Thank you, Cindy. Ellen, how do you feel this morning as we're gathered here to pray? and? 
I'm here for victory, Father Frank. I'm here for victory. We're going to see a victory at the U.S. Supreme Court. We've seen God moving on America, and we've seen the most pro-life president in American history, right. Donald Trump, do more for the pro-life movement than any president ever has. And I believe the two justices that he appointed are fair-minded people who will give an open mind to this case and other courses. They don't have a closed mind about abortion. They think, I'm willing to listen to the evidence. And the evidence is abortion hurts women. It kills a human being. There's a better way to help women in America through the safe haven laws by which any woman that doesn't want to take care of a child can drop that baby off at a hospital or fire station. No questions asked, no money. The abortion industry doesn't like it because it's free. Safe haven is free. Use the free alternative, okay? And don't kill the baby. Don't hurt yourself. Give us the baby, and we'll give it to the millions of people exactly. that are desperately Amen. waiting for a millions. newborn baby. Millions. So it's a win-win-win for everybody, and only God could put that in place. I give all the credit to God. He is going to be giving us a victory. Thank you all for praying. Thank you, Father Pavone, for having your prayer movement going on uh, for the court. Keep praying all the way till June 30th right. when we know this case will probably be decided around that time or, or released. And, and, of course, you, as in previous court cases, you, you, know, you and I have collaborated together on this prayer effort. Isn't tomorrow 40 days since the... Since the March for Life. It is. And Father Paul, and here's another amazing thing. So from the March to Life to tomorrow, March 4th, is 40 days. We've been praying for life for 40 days. Today, March 3rd, is the 50th anniversary of the filing of the Roe v. Wade lawsuit in Dallas, Texas. Oh, my goodness. On March 3rd, 1970, they filed the lawsuit to set aside the Texas law and eventually every pro-life law, every law protecting life in America. Mm. So it took three years to get to the Supreme Court. That's why we often say it's the 47th anniversary of the, of Roe, v. Wade, right. the Roe v. Wade Supreme Court decision. Right. But today is the 50th day. It's a day of Jubilee. Tomorrow will be the first day after the 50 years mm. are over and I believe it will be the beginning of the Jubilee ending abortion in America. And so uh, Jubilee is the, the obligations and the debts and the slavery of the past is overcome. There is a lot of a lot of spiritual significance going on here. And I think we may be getting ready. Are we ready to start? Uh, okay. We are going to start our rally, friends. So we'll let you listen in to, uh, to what's about to happen now. It, it, what Alan was saying was, was very significant, too, from this perspective, that the voices of these women who have been damaged by abortion, and he, through Operation Outcry, and we, through Silent No More, and Rachel's Vineyard, have identified uh, these women. We minister to these women every day, all around the country. And many of them have signed affidavits attesting under, under a, a serious oath that, um, that they have been harmed. Uh, by abortion and those affidavits have been given to this court and are part of this case so uh, that is a significant dimension of this and we have Georgette here uh, are we uh, uh, gonna get underway we're getting underway <laughs> so I don't know why I wanted to come and interrupt you because I didn't know how you were gonna handle we're gonna this just up. we're gonna just okay. let the folks right. watch right. yep hi everyone <laughs> <laughs> Georgette is a co-founder of silent no more as many of you know Should I attach this to the yep. podium? Yeah, that'd be great, Father. Just to, easy, just to the behind the sign here. That good? Yep. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming to the testimonies and prayer time of women injured by abortion. 
We're going to begin with the blowing of the trumpets in the book of Numbers 10. It said, when the enemy comes into your land, blow the twin silver trumpets and the Lord will hear and remember you and your covenant and come and fight for you. So we're here for victory in the uh, Louisiana abortion case tomorrow. And we're going to hear, first of all, the blowing of the trumpets. we ask that you come and be with us today as we pray for the end of abortion in America. We're going to sing one song first called uh, We the People of the United States. We the People of the United States. Amen. Let's turn it up. Thank you, Jesus. It will be safe through the safe haven laws. Every woman in America will be able to be free of the burden of child care by giving the state the child's and saying to the child, we give you our children. And who will take care of those children? The women hurt by abortion? No. Women who are infertile and eager to have a child. Humbly petition you to redress and correct the grave injustice and the crime against humanity which is being perpetrated by your decision in Roe v. Wade Doe v. Wotan and Blanche Perry to the KC we urgently plead with you and pray to the Lord Jesus Christ for the United States Supreme Court to do the right thing we the people, we the people of the United States. We cried out for mercy. We cried out for justice. We the people, we the people of the United States. We cried out for the babies. We cried out for life. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal all men are created equal that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights that among these are We cry out for justice. We the people, we the people of the United States. We cry out for the babies. We cry out for life. For life. We the people, we the people of the United States. We cry out for mercy. We cry out for justice. We the people, we the people of the United States. We cry out for the babies. We cry out for life. We cry out for the babies. 
We cry out for life. We cry out for the babies. We cry out for life. For life. For life. Amen. My name is Alan Parker. I'm the president of the Justice Foundation. I represent 2,624 women hurt by abortion who filed an amici voice, an amici brief, so that their voices could be heard in the Supreme Court that abortion hurts women. Today we're going to begin to speak those voices today. Their testimonies are already in the court. Actually, 4,660 testimonies of women hurt by abortion. We have the Silent No More Awareness Campaign also, which are women speaking about their abortions. And the Operation Outcry, a movement, uh, is it? And we waited until the other group was finished with their demonstration so that we would be able to have a peaceful demonstration here. So, Georgette, are you ready to introduce the women who are going to give their testimonies? Or, Father Pavone, do you want to say anything before we start? Why don't you let Father Frank? Thank you. Thank you, Alan. It is a pleasure to be here with you, with the women of Operation Outcry, with Georgette, our co-founder of the Silent No More Awareness Campaign, together with Janet Morana, joint project of Priests for Life and Anglicans for Life. And I serve, of course, as National Director of Priests for Life. To put this in context here, what's happening today, tonight, with the prayer vigil that will take place in front of this court from 6 to 7, press conference this afternoon at the National Press Club, and then a major rally tomorrow when the court will hear the oral argument starting at 10 a.m. To put this in perspective, the law that the Supreme Court is reviewing in this case does not prohibit a single abortion. This is not a law that was designed to take away the so-called right to choose an abortion. Now, of course, we oppose the idea that there is such a thing as a right to have an abortion. But that's not what this law or this case is about. What this case is about is a law that the Louisiana duly elected legislators, knowing better the scene on the ground in Louisiana than any of us do, although some of our friends here are from Louisiana and they know it very well, the duly elected lawmakers of the state said we need to make sure that we implement something that Roe versus Wade said. Roe versus Wade in 1973 issued from this court legalizing abortion throughout pregnancy said also that the states may in fact should ensure that the procedure is carried out in such a way that maximizes the health and safety of the women who go there to get their abortions. And the Roe versus Wade decision said that the physicians must be held responsible if they do not protect the health and safety of women. The duly elected lawmakers of Louisiana then examined the record of the abortion clinics in Louisiana, which have had over the decades since Roe, numerous violations of health and safety. In the booklet called Unsafe, our friends at Americans United for Life outlined over 1,400 health and safety violations committed by 227 abortion facilities in 32 states. These violations were in 10 different categories, and unfortunately the abortion clinics of Louisiana fell in nine of those 10 categories. Violations such as the following. Untrained staff, people who were not doctors or nurses, doing medical procedures on these women. I wonder why anyone who supports a woman's right to choose would want an untrained person carrying out medical procedures 
on those women. They care about those women, but they don't care whether or not the person doing what a doctor should do is actually a doctor. Untrained staff, expired medications. I guess some people who want to control their body would prefer that the medicines put into those bodies are expired and unsafe. How about emergency medical equipment? Many of these clinics were found not to have defibrillators. You can walk through an airport and see defibrillators all over in the terminal. Why wouldn't you have them in a surgical facility? Other violations include the improper handling of medications, the improper handling of medical records, lack of confidentiality of medical records, not monitoring patients' vital signs as they're undergoing or in subsequent follow-up to the surgical procedure that they had. Louisiana abortion facilities violated these and numerous other health safety standards. What's going on here in the court tomorrow is not the idea of doing away with legal abortion. It's the idea of making sure that if in fact our law is going to consider abortion to be a medical procedure, that it should live up to the standards of medicine. So brothers and sisters, we're here today with the voices of those who know best how abortion impacts them, because they had the procedure. So many women who have experienced directly the utter contempt in which the abortionists hold these women. And we stand in solidarity with these women as they seek healing, as they speak their testimony, and we're going to hear some of that today. As I mentioned at the outset, Georgette Forney, who herself uh, had the misfortune of having an abortion, uh, co-founded with Janet Miranda the Silent No More campaign in Louisiana, throughout the 50 states, and throughout the world. This campaign gives voice to the women who have been harmed by abortion. And Georgette now will come to the uh, podium as we continue this time of prayer, education, and witness. Georgette, thank you for being here. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. I am honored to help organize these ladies and the strength and the courage of them to speak their abortion experience out. Before we get started, we thought we would like to have one more worship song to bring the presence of Jesus here with us. Call for a fresh outpouring of the Holy Spirit. So our great musician here, we thank you so much for being here. Shine, Jesus, shine. Lord, the light of your love is shining into the darkness. Your love is shining. Jesus, light of the world, shine down on us. Let your truth now touch our nation. Shine on Shine on us. Shine. 
your holy name we praise you and we thank you that you are here with us be present all of us thank you for being here as we feel the Holy Spirit's present come fresh upon us such a unique moment that we get to stand here and bring the presence of Christ with us I would have never dreamt when I stood over there in 2002 holding a sign that said, I regret choosing to abort my baby, that I would be here 20, or 17, 18 years doing things when we give him our lives. I stood there in front of the pro-abortion candlelight vigil that was out here, and they were singing their keep your rosaries off my ovary song, and I was hoping that they would care about me as a woman that held a sign that said, I regret what I did. I regret having an abortion. I really hoped that the pro-lifers who said that the pro-aborts didn't really care about women were really wrong. I came here to prove them. And actually, I was the wrong one. I realized the pro-aborts really didn't care about women. They really cared about profits. They cared about protecting abortion. And as I walked back to the hotel that night, I wept and I got angry. And you know what happens when a woman gets angry. <laughs> Something's going to happen. And that's when we started coming up with the idea of a campaign to raise, an aware, raise awareness about the reality of abortion. Everybody was talking about abortion, but nobody was talking to the women who had had the abortion, the consumers. And I kept thinking we needed to change that. So that's how we got to the Silent No More Awareness campaign. I had my abortion when I was 16 years old. I really didn't know what abortion was, but a friend said that it would make my problem pregnancy go away, and I did not want people knowing what I was really doing. So I had an abortion. I immediately went into denial and pretended it didn't happen. I shut down that Saturday afternoon and I moved forward as fast and as hard as I could. And I worked very hard to change my ways and, and everything be different about me. But that truth that what I did was always back there. I went on to get married. I went on to have a child. I went on to try to live my life as a new Christian woman. But as I would go forward, I would keep thinking, somebody's going to find out about my abortion, and they're going to kick me out of the church. My husband isn't going to want me anymore. My baby is going to reject me. And it was only when I stopped denying what I had done in my heart, and I admitted that not only did I have an abortion, but I aborted a human being. You see, I had a five-year-old now, so I understood what the biology of the baby was and what it really meant to be pregnant, that you really do devel devel deliver a child. I understood that in a fresh way. And I realized that this, that year I would have a graduating high school senior. 
I should have had a graduating high school senior. And all I had instead were tears. Those tears began my healing time. When I started grieving the death of my child is when the denial stopped and the truth set me free. The healing program Forgiven and Set Free was phenomenal. I am so grateful I had the ability to go through it. Not only that, I was able to later go on and do the Rachel's Vineyard Weekend Retreat, and that helped even more. All of it led me to understand that no sin is greater than God's cross, and that God really does love all of us unconditionally. God loves all sinners, and he just wants us to come to him. You know, for 19 years prior to that healing, I think I might have even been one of those folks that held those signs that said, my body, my choice, because I felt I needed to justify my actions. But when I faced my actions instead of justifying them, I was able to put down the, the lie and the truth set me free. It is the same story you're going to hear from a group of courageous women now. And I pray that all of our stories would go forth from here and that they would be used on Facebook and they would be used by you all to help the truth get out there. We are here today because we want the reality of abortion to be part of what these justices understand is why this law is so important to, to uphold. So thank you, and I am so honored and pleased to introduce my sister in Christ, Cindy Collins, and her leadership at Operation Outcry. Cindy? Thank you, Georgette. I honor you, and I honor Alan Parker and also Father Frank Pavone as men that have stood with us as women's voices are crying out more and more of the pain that abortion has caused with many of us for 47 years. And I'm still hearing that pain today as one who counsels women in Louisiana. And I've been hearing it for the past, let's say 35 years since I've been a Christian, since I came to the Lord and he healed my heart from the brokenness of abortion. Nothing has changed. You know, many years ago, I was told to get up, get out, and to shut up by an abortionist. And I was left hemorrhaging outside of an abortion facility, laying on the ground with blood soaking the back of my skirt. I had no doctor-patient relationship. I didn't even, I'd never seen this person before. And that's the type of care that I am still hearing from the women that I am serving in Louisiana. Abortionists do not speak for us. We never see them again. You know, there may be some of us that would have felt some sense of relief after abortion. And I've even heard abortionists say, but women come up to me and thank me. And I say to them, and where are you? when that woman is crying in her home, when she's thinking about committing suicide, when, as I heard last week from somebody who used to work inside of an abortion facility, I go home and I hear babies crying. Where are they then? All that I know is that they have taken the money from the women that I serve and they've left the women behind. They aren't seeing the brokenness. They aren't hearing and they don't care about the women that are infertile, that have had punctured uteruses, that have been left with drug addiction, broken relationships. The worth and value of a woman is diminished by abortion. When I was 19, when I was 19 years old, I came to Washington, D.C and I had gone to a Planned Parenthood clinic in Pennsylvania, and they referred me to an abortion facility in Washington, D.C. That was my journey with abortion. I went through severe pain. My baby was 
suctioned out. It was 29 times that of a vacuum cleaner, and it set me on a downward spiral of drugs, alcohol. The reason why I had the abortion was so that I could go on with my college. And what happened was I dropped out. I mean, I dropped out, period, of humanity, but I dropped out of school. I could not handle it. And I went on a downward spiral, promiscuous relationships, repeat abortions over and over again. Completely destroyed my heart until I came into a relationship with the Lord and I confessed what I had done. I had no place to go, no man to go to, but I went to the Lord and he did not turn me away from that brokenness. Now I want to say this to any woman that's listening, you may be like me, and you may be like Georgette, and you may be like the women that you're hearing, and you may have kept that in your heart for 5, 10, 15, 20, 50 years, some of the women that I have counseled. You may even be on the picket line or protesting, and I wanna tell you that you have not gone too far, and you have not gone far away, and it's not too late for you to turn. The Lord hears your, your cry. He knows your heart. He knows truly what's going on. And any sign that you're carrying is a sign to the Lord that you are still yes, broken. Yes, yes. And he loves you. And he's yes. come for you. Yes. And he wants to heal you and give you a new voice. Amen. I'm going to say this, that before... Uh, uh, it's going to be Jeannie that's going to come up, is that we are asking in the state of Louisiana for the protection of women and the protection of life. The abortionists there, there were two that were hired by the abortion facility, that one was an ophthalmologist and one was a radiologist. What were they doing doing abortions? They didn't even know how to take care of women. And the women that we have served, even a woman in 2019 that she had to have a hysterectomy because of a botched abortion. So as you're listening to these stories that are coming up today, know that we represent the millions of women in our nation that have been hurt by abortion. And our message to the abortionist is get up, get out, and keep silent in Jesus' name. Amen. Hello everyone, I'm Jeannie and I am from Hammond, Louisiana. I am a woman terribly hurt by abortion, two abortions in the state of Louisiana that brings to you tomorrow at 620, which we pray will be upheld to protect the very women like me. Today, I don't wear the face of abortion. You look at me and you see a Catholic Christian woman. I'm a mom. I'm a wife, I'm a restaurateur, and at surface level, I look just like the next lady standing next to you. But the reality is, abortion lives inside each and every one of us, this side of heaven, aside from the perfection and repair that comes from Jesus Christ himself, we all share in that pain that lives just below the surface, the injuries done to us by the abortionist who only wanted our money. It's curious that there was ever a time ever in my life that I was not pro-life. To the very moment leading up to my own abortion, I was pro-life and knew what was about to transpire was gravely wrong and intrinsically evil. I was in a place that had been transformed raised right to experiencing freedoms and all the things that making negative choices brought with it. I had become promiscuous and with that, lost my self-love, self-worth, and could no longer see my own identity in Christ. The scariest thing that ever could have happened to me did, and I found myself pregnant, scared to death, unsupported, and alone. There would be no, mom, dad, we're pregnant, and these are our plans. The thought of telling my parents that my one night stand ended in pregnancy was fueled by unrealistic fears from the enemy. By the thought that this was just too big, too great to get past, 
I felt like my only option had to be abortion. The appointment was ridiculously easy to get at Delta Women's Clinic in Baton Rouge. The date was January 27, 1991. Rem I remember a few people standing outside, some of them praying and some holding signs. I walked past them with my head down toward the entrance. Upon entering, I went over to the front desk. I was asked for my name, ID, and money. I was given an envelope that contained some pills and was told to be seated and wait. No one talked with me about the upcoming procedure, what it would entail, what to expect before, during, or after, or the effects of what I would encounter. When the paid executioner approached, he seemed to examine me. He questioned how far along I was, but the reality was this. I had no real clue. I had received no medical care, no ultrasound, no real way of knowing how pregnant I was. I could only guess. Regardless, he continued on. I remember a deafening suction roar. He inserted the device and I was in utter shock from the force and the pain that was inflicted. My body felt contorted from the pain and my heart ripped into a million pieces just as my baby's body did. If my baby weren't fighting to live, why then was the insane force needed to rob him of his precious life? I was so afraid and just knew that I would die there from this horrible thing I was allowing. Surely my death would be my punishment and my parents would found out, find out that way. I remember speaking loudly and repeating, Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. Over and over and it angered the abortionist. He told the assistant with him, make her shut up. I felt the enemy's presence so strongly. A part of me did die that day along with my baby. I was summoned to a room, a dark room, with cots scantily clad in white sheets. Girls in hospital gowns were instructed to lay down until we were directed to dress and leave. Some of them were silent, some of them wept. I wept so hard and so ashamedly over what I'd done and the fact that I could never change it. There was no going back. I laid there heavily bleeding and violently cramping. No one came to examine me or instruct me on what would happen next. Later, I was told to dress and leave out the back door. No one leaves the way they came in. I imagine ladies seeing this apocalyptic zombie-like scene might choose otherwise. My days were draped with anxiety and depression, my nights in fear, bad dreams, and lots of alcohol consumption. My new motto became, drink till you can't think. My self-worth was zero, and every choice I made reflected it. Thus, bringing about another abortion. Other long-term effects from abortion that I suffered were Preterm labor, including much hospitalization for two of my subsequent pregnancies due to immense scarring of my uterus. I can't have those days, months, or years back, but I will never stop trying to, to right this wrong. I will never stop warning others, sharing my truth, truth, and dispelling the myth that abortion is safe, quick procedure, and that you'll be able to return to your normal life after having one. It is an eternal interruption of what was intended by God, life. It's time that the cloak is removed from the face of abortion. I will do my part and I will never detract nor back down from revealing this evil. Abortionists have no concern for the woman and certainly none for the child. They are the bottom of the barrel in the health profession and it's why they operate so secretively. It's why they do not seek hospital admitting privileges in the vicinity of their dirty work that yields so much blood money. The light will be turned on though, rest assured. And when it is, they will scatter like roaches looking to hide from the evilness that they do. God help us all and please vote to uphold Act 620. Amen. God bless you all. God bless you, sweetheart. Good morning, everyone. My name is Lorena Stoltenberg, and my life has been devastated by abortion. 
As a teenager at the abortion facility, I was told that it wasn't a baby at all. It was only a blob of tissue. The truth was my baby had a heartbeat, brain waves, fingers, and toes. They said that the procedure would be easy and safe. In fact, safer than if I carried to term. They didn't tell me about the procedure or the risks of it. The industry is not held to the same standards as the rest of the medical industry. I waited on a cold table for the doctor I had never met and would never see again to do this surgical procedure. He said I'd feel slight cramping and a little bit of tugging sensation. The pain was almost unbearable. On the drive home, I was in extreme pain and bleeding profusely. So when I arrived home, I called the abortion facility. Their response was, I'm sorry you're no longer our problem. And they hung up. This is health care? I was too ashamed to call anyone. So I waited to bleed to death that night. A part of me did die. I was depressed, I was angry, I was filled with guilt and shame, and so to numb that pain, I began drinking, doing drugs, and became very promiscuous, which led to two more abortions. My third abortion was done in an old, filthy, two-story home that was converted to an abortion facility. I was so ashamed that I did not give them my real name. They never asked for an ID. Since then, I've wondered what would have happened if there would have been a complication or if I would have died on the table that day? Who would they have called? Years later, through prayers my of my parents, I received Jesus Christ and I got married and I wanted children and we were not having any success. They told me I was infertile because of the damage the abortions had done to my tubes and my uterus. I had to go home and tell my husband that he was never going to have his own biological children because of choices I had made in my life. I killed the only children I would ever bear. I still suffer the effects of the abortions. I had to have a mandatory hysterectomy because of all the medical issues, because of the section procedure. Most days I think about my children, who they would have been, my heart hurts, missing who my grandchildren would be now. Abortion is not health care. Women deserve a better solution than to kill their children. So on behalf of all of us who are hurting, we ask, don't allow the courts or the abortion industry to speak for us and silence us anymore. Thank you. My name is Andrea, and I want to thank you all for the opportunity to be able to come and give my testimony. In 1981, at age 32, I was in a relationship and became pregnant. I was filled with shame, guilt, and disgrace. I talked with my local OBGYN. He handed me a brochure from an abortion facility in Atlanta, Georgia. He gave me no encouragement, resource information on adoption, or other options. I later learned my OBGYN was receiving kickbacks from the abortion industry. I was six weeks pregnant, in despair, and very ignorant of what abortion really was. I felt my decision for an abortion was my only option. The father of my baby drove me to the clinic. He paid for the abortion. There was no doctor-patient relationship. I never saw or talked with the doctor. Had I seen an ultrasound of my baby, I would never believe the lie of the abortion industry. It's only a blob of tissue, the, pre the pro procedure is quick, and you'll return to your normal life. I was given a drug to put me out. I knew when the doctor came in, I heard the suction machine start, then I was out. All they wanted was my money. My abortion completed. After a short recovery, I was told to get dressed and leave. There would be no aftercare if I had any problems. I was to contact my regular doctor or go to an ER. Engulfed with an overwhelming sense of emptiness and loss, I numbly walked into the clinic, the clinic waiting room, to see the look of distress on my boyfriend's face. He'd heard women screaming from the direction of the procedure room, and he thought it was me. 
My abortion decisionally, decision emotionally destroyed this father-to-be. We both were left emotionally and psychologically numb. Our relationship ended. Life for me was one of regret, shame, guilt, depression, suicidal thoughts, destructive behavior patterns, alcohol, abusive relationships, and the secrecy of what I had done. Post-abortion syndrome is horrendous and it affects both women and men. They suffer in silence, offering covering their shame and guilt of abortion with alcohol and drugs. They experience regret, remorse, shame, guilt, emptiness, hopelessness, and the list goes on. Women lose their ability to bond with existing or future children, leaving in its wake families with generations of unnurtured persons. Men can lose their sense of provision. Abortion can cause infertility, miscarriage, and possible death to the woman the result of a botched abortion. Abortion has taken a toll on our nation. Enough is enough. It's time for all women and men involved with abortion in any capacity to come forth and tell the truth about abortion so they and our nation can heal. Beautifully done, sweetie. Very well done. My name is Rebecca Porter, and I gave three abortionists money to take care of my problem. In return, I re developed an aversion to babies, self-hate, drug addictions, alcoholism, and suicide attempts, and the loss of my children that can never be replaced. I never had a doctor-patient relationship with any of the abortionists. It was strictly a financial transaction. I don't even feel like I was a patient because if they were doctors, they would have followed their Hippocratic Oath and helped me with my problem and saved the life of my children. Instead, they had their staff lie and tell me that it was just a clump of cells and it wasn't a baby. None of the abortionists ever spoke to me before any of the procedures started. My feet were already up in the stirrups when they came into the room. They, or any of their staff, ever counseled me on how abortion would affect me physically or even emotionally. After my first abortion, I immediately developed an aversion to babies. When I got home from the abortion facility, my son was six months old and he was crying. My girlfriend was watching him, and he started to cry when he saw me, and I couldn't even hold him. I couldn't even take him. After that, when my son started to cry, I would just put him in his crib or his playpen and walk out of the room. I couldn't be around anybody's babies. I was a terrible mom. I couldn't take care of him properly. I began to drink heavily, do drugs, and I lived in the bars. Years later, I actually went for a second abortion. It was a harder choice this time because I knew it was a baby. Do women carry anything in their wombs other than baby humans? Once again, the staff took my money and took me to the room without ever meeting the abortionist. I told the nurse that I was upset because I'd gotten pregnant while on the pill. She told me about the Depo-Provera and guaranteed me that I couldn't get pregnant. After giving them more money, once again, I had the Depo-Provera shot. I had side effects like moodiness, depression, a decreased sex drive. I decided not to get the second shot and go back on the pill. A few weeks later, a pregnancy test showed positive. I was in shock. It was already hard living with myself after the second abortion. So I decided to have the baby and place it for adoption. I knew I'd be able to live with myself and for that choice. But the father of the baby, he told me that he would refuse to sign the adoption papers. He didn't want me to have an abortion, but it was my choice. I felt trapped, so I went back to the abortion facility. I was crying when I walked in the door. Nobody asked 
if I was okay emotionally. But they did ask how far along I was, and I didn't know because of the depth of a bear shot. I had no idea. They never did a sonogram to find out. I laid on the abortion table crying. I stared at the ceiling, so mad at myself for being there again, so mad that I'd been lied to about the depth of a bear shot. The nurse came over to me and she patted me on the arm and she said, it's okay, it'll be over soon. But I knew what I was doing was not okay and I knew it was not be over soon. I wouldn't even look at her. But after a while, the abortionist came in, the procedure started, the suction machine turned on, it became very, very painful. And I began to cry out louder. And about that time, the nurse, she walked down to look at the table to see what was wrong. And that's when I did look at her and I saw her look down towards the floor at the jar. And then she said, oh look, twins. And she looked up at me and she smiled. I went into shock. The first thing I did, I screamed, oh my God, what have I done? And I began to scream, stop, stop. And then the abortionist began to scream at me and tell me to lay still that he couldn't stop the nurse. And they had to call someone else in the room to hold me down so that he could finish. I tried to end my life twice within the next three months. I hated myself and them for the horrible trauma I experienced at the abortion facility. But the Lord saved me and allowed me to live and to tell my story how abortion hurt me, how the abortionist never spoke to me, and that I, they will never speak for me or for women. Thank you. Lisa Gould. I am from Louisiana and I want to share my abortion experiences with you today. I had two pregnancies terminated at the Hope Medical Group for Women in Shreveport, Louisiana. One in 1985 and one in 1993. I was 18 years old the first time and uncertain of what was about to happen to me on that Saturday in September. I filled out my paperwork and was asked for the payment up front and told to wait until I was called to the back. When I walked back to the back room, there was a brief consult with one of their staff telling me that the procedure would only take 15 minutes. There was no doctor-patient relationship whatsoever. There was no ultrasound shown. I was then given a sedative and told to bring my clothes with me and wait in a small room. The room was full of girls sitting in a line and waiting until their time to go in. It literally felt like we were cattle being led to the slaughter. The room was dark and full of death and despair. I was never um, allowed to speak to the doctor or have any conversation with him. And I remember a cloth covering the ultrasound. I remember the smell of gas making me sick and I could feel sharp pain and pressure in my lower abdomen as the procedure was taking place, taking my child from my body. Afterwards, I was given my clothes in my bag and told to sit in their relaxation room. I got sick and threw up sitting in the chair while bleeding heavily. I felt a darkness that I could not explain. I felt deeply depressed afterwards. I started to smoke, drink alcohol, and became promiscuous. That experience would shape me for the rest of my life. In December of 1993, while in my late 20s, I found myself pregnant again and feeling that abortion was my only choice because I was divorced and raising my eldest son. My boyfriend drove me to the facility. He ended the relationship a week later and I was not only left without a baby that I wanted, but I was alone and broken beyond measure. It led me on a 12 year down spiral of depression, numerous health problems, a hysterectomy, other numerous gastro problems. Because of scarring in my uterine wall, I am surprised I really gave 
birth to my second child. I was unable to have any more biological children after him. It has taken me years of recovery to undo what those experiences did to me. The abortion industry does not care about women. You can see that in the way that they treated me with no conversation, no ultrasound pictures, nothing, no aftercare. They work against ensuring protections that are in place for every other outpatient procedure in the state of Louisiana. What happened to me is still happening to women today. No girl or woman should ever have to experience what I did in the com incompetent care of abortionists who are more concerned about their profits than their patients. I beg you today, please stand for our women and our children, our daughters, our granddaughters in this country. We need to end abortion. We ask you to stand for Act 620 tomorrow. Thank you so much. Hello, my name is Molly White. I am from Bell County, Texas. I am the Texas leader of Operation Outcry. I am uh, 37, 38 years post-abortive, and I'm also a former Texas state representative. But uh, when I was 21 years old, I got pregnant, and I went to a local uh, medical clinic to have a pregnancy test ran. And when the doctor came in with my results, he told me I was pregnant, and he walked up to me and patted me on the knee and says, don't worry, you don't look too happy. You can have an abortion. It's safe, and it's easy, and you'll get your life all back together again. And he was so kind to write the name and number of an abortion clinic on a prescription pad and handed it to me. I didn't know this doctor and he didn't know me, but he planted a seed in my head that I would have never dreamt of before because abortion was not a part of my world. I didn't know anything about it. And so as I went home, my mind started to think, well, the father of this child has already abandoned me. I can uh, avoid shaming my parents. You know, you know, it would be difficult to raise a child on my own. So I started uh, thinking about maybe why I should check this out. So I called the number to an abortion clinic in Austin, Texas, and they were very kind to schedule me appointment right away. As my friend drove me there, my mind and my heart started to battle. And I couldn't understand what was going on. Looking back, it was my mother's instincts trying to appeal to me. So when I got to the abortion clinic, I decided I would ask them three important questions. One was a fetal development. I said, I'm probably six to eight, week pre eight weeks pregnant. What does my baby look like? And the lady took a pen and put a tiny little dot on a piece of paper and said, it's just a tiny dot of cells. And so I thought, okay, well, it's not formed yet. And I said, well, what is the procedure like? She goes, they're just gonna clean you out and it'll feel like you're starting your period and you'll be in and out in 20 minutes. And then I asked, are there any consequences? Is there any trouble after? Oh no, it's so safe. So I was deceived. I wrote a book called Deceived into thinking that abortion was the answer to my problem. But on the table when they were sucking up the life of my child, it hit me what I was doing. And I was overcome with trauma. And it was the most excruciating, painful, thing that I've ever been through in my life. And when they were done with me, they escorted me out the back door into a back alley full of trash cans. And I was so overcome with emotion and guilt and trauma, I didn't know how to process it, so I tried to just bury it. But my life took a downward spiral. I began to drink and do drugs just to numb the pain. My second abortion, I was highly pressured into it. I'd already delivered triplets and two of them were stillborn and I thought God had punished me. But my, I got pressured to have a, a, a second abortion after my son was only a year and a half years old. And I didn't want to do it. But I ended up at this clinic, the same clinic that delivered my triplets with a different doctor. And he did a two, uh, a second trimester abortion procedure. So he inserted laminara into my cervix. I was to go home my cervix was to be stretched out, and I was to go home, go back the next day to finish the procedure. 
As soon as he inserted the laminera, I went to pieces. I started screaming and shouting, and the nurse brought him back in. I said, take it out. I can't do this. I've already had an abortion. I just buried two babies. I have a little boy at home. I can't do this. And he lied to me. He said he couldn't take it out. It would damage me and I would have a miscarriage. And so that home was, I went home and went back the next day, broken, wounded, traumatized. And I begged him, I said, I can't do this. I've already had an abortion. I just buried two babies. I have a son at home. I can't do this. He goes, you have to do it. If you don't do it, you'll miscarry. And I laid there on that table crying and begging as he aborted my child, not knowing that I could run and go somewhere else. I left the clinic that day a walking dead woman. I was dead to my emotions. I was dead to my feelings. I was dead to my memories. And I tried to be a good mother, but I was a very broken and wounded mother. I went on later to get married. I had a miscarriage. Praise God, I was able to give birth to another child, but then I had to have a hysterectomy because my uterus was so damaged. I'm here to tell you that abortion hurts women. It does not answer or solve any problems. It only causes multiple problems with, with women and men and even my surviving children. The abortion industry does not speak for women. They speak for a multi-billion dollar industry that leaves in its wake wounded men, women, and society. So I'm here to beg the justices to stand for women's health and to do what is right for women, not the abortion industry. Thank you. Serena Dian from Port Byron, Illinois. I was the tender age of 15 when I became pregnant. I was extremely scared to tell my parents because I come from a culture where it is an absolute dishonor to have a baby outside of wedlock. So my life took a turn for the worst when they found out. I was mentally, emotionally, and verbally worn down in my home, which was behavior I had never experienced before. It devastated me to feel such anger, threats, and hatred as I tried to take a stand for life. I wanted to have the baby, yet the more I resisted, the worse the abuse became. Finally, after a week of immense pressure, I couldn't take any more. In a worn down state of vulnerability, I was taken to Iowa City Planned Parenthood abortion facility. In the waiting room, there were several women, and I began to cry. I was upsetting the women around me, so I was escorted back early. I was given an ultrasound, and I saw my baby on the monitor. I looked at the tech and said, I can't do it. I just can't have an abortion. My parents had to take me home. A week later, I ended up at a different clinic where they didn't perform an ultrasound, but instead I met with a counselor who told me that what I saw on that screen wasn't even a baby, but it was more like an alien. I was taken back to a room where a nurse held my hand and they strapped me down to a bed. The abortion doctor came in, didn't look at me or speak to me. He just performed the abortion and left. It was traumatizing to hear my baby sucked into the vacuum machine. I went home where I heavily bled huge clots that scared me and was left to cope with the pain all by myself. After the abortion, I became different. I lost a ton of weight and became very emotionally unstable. I carried the weight of my abortion even into my next pregnancy as a young adult, which was medically high risk. I suffered from an incompetent cervix and spent most of my pregnancy in and out of the hospital with threatened miscarriages, preterm labor, and on bed rest. In fact, all five of my children were born early due to abortion. Sadly, no one at the abortion facility told me or my parents that an abortion could affect my future pregnancy so seriously. After my first daughter was born, 
I began to get some healing simply by being a mom to the most beautiful baby girl. But the pain, shame, guilt, depression, inadequacy, and insecurity never left. It wasn't until I found a relationship with Jesus Christ that I was able to fully heal from the abortion. Years of Christian counseling and ministries helped me to recover, receive forgiveness, forgive myself and others, and heal. You see, abortion didn't just end my pregnancy. It ended the life of my baby. It hurt me. It hurt my body. And it hurt my future pregnancies. Abortion didn't secure my future. Instead, it robbed me of the healthy pregnancies I should have had. There was nothing safe about the legal abortion that I had. Women's health should be treated as a whole. And if legal abortion has hurt me and women, not only physically, but mentally, spiritually, and emotionally, then abortion is not safe health care for women. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Nancy Lincoln and I am from Iowa. I am here today to stand in support of the Louisiana women fighting for the protection of future generations of women who deserve better medical care than what we are presently getting in this country. When I was just 19 years old, I became pregnant. I was single, alone, and scared. So I went to Planned Parenthood for help. The nurse said I was nine weeks pregnant, hey, but that this was nothing more than a blob of tissue and how an abortion her, could be a quick and easy solution to for this burden. Switch it out. Can you hold it? That was it. She never shared oh, any other options with me like parenting or adoption, nor was I given any medical information about the possible risks of abortion. The physical, emotional, mental, or spiritual consequences of procedure. I never met the doctor to ask him any questions. The nurse simply reassured me that abortion was my best choice and that no one would ever know, which was my greatest fear. Regrettably, I believed her and my life has never been the same. Abortion ended my pregnancy, but it only added to the emotional weight of guilt and shame, which were crushing. And for the next 16 years, I tried, I tried really hard to deny what I had done. And I was haunted, haunted by my abortion secret. I used men, alcohol, drugs to cope. It felt like heavy chains wrapped around my very soul. And I suffered in silence. I couldn't tell anyone for fear of their judgment. And I even got married and didn't tell my husband about my past abortion pain. I was so conflicted by this since it was my body and my choice and my legal right I thought I was the only one suffering. Then God did a miracle, and I met the Lord Jesus Christ and heard about that old, old story about a savior that came from glory to save a wretch like me. And I trusted in him and I was forgiven, but I wasn't set free from that abortion still. I was chained. Years later, by the grace of God and the goodness of God in my life, I started working at a pregnancy care center. And I learned about post-abortion syndrome. And I went through a grief study to help me with this past abortion pain. After the study, I realized I'm already forgiven. That's all that that Bible study reminded me was the blood of Jesus was enough to cover that sin. And I rejoiced in that, and I still rejoice in that. I expected when we, I was given a field development brochure during that um, Bible study, and they said to look up the stage of development that the baby was at when I had the abortion. So when I opened it up, I expected only to discover what the nurse had said, that it was just a blob of tissue. 
I opened up the brochure and much to my horror, I came to day 21, which read, the heart begins to beat. My heart sunk into my stomach. The heart begins to beat? What do you mean? This is only three weeks and my abortion was at nine weeks. A sense of despair flood into my soul as I realized that I had been lied to and that this was no blob of tissue. This was my baby. Or just get someone else My baby with a heartbeat and 10 fingers and 10 toes and was totally alive. And this is what it looked like. This is a 12 week old fetus and mine was just about a half an inch smaller than this when I aborted it. What is this? This is a baby. This is not a blob of tissue. This would forever change my life to see this picture. Today, I gratefully know the truth and I want to declare here today in the United States of America in front of the Supreme Court that all children are a gift from God, a blessing, and that the fruit of the womb is his reward. It is his reward and we need to embrace life, not destroy it. In closing, I just wish someone, anyone would have been there to protect me from the abortion industry's lies. Women just table. like me and millions of others deserve this truth so that we will no longer be deceived and be at the mercy of the abortion industry profiting off of our suffering. Let's do the right thing and make the womb of a woman the safest yes. place on earth yes. beginning yes. in the United States of America. Yes. Thank you. My name is Susan Keegan, and I'm from DeWitt, Iowa, and my story is so similar from so many of these stories that you have already heard, and I am blessed and honored to be here today. You see, I'm a mom. I've been married for 37 years. I have five adult children. Our home has been filled with joy and love, and now the extra special gift of granddaughters. They contribute to our country, they're working, they're paying taxes, they're buying homes, they're teaching, and yes, they're voting. Just recently, I visited my hometown for a high school reunion. It was very sad, the buildings were abandoned and the schoolyards were empty. You see, my school had been forced to close. It was low in Roman, I heard. But what stunned me most was the football field. The football field was completely overgrown. It still had the goal post standing where they should have been, and the bleachers were still there, the home site and the visitor. But what struck me was that all those bleachers were completely empty, and it was completely silent. In my high school years, it had been filled with the brim, and it was extremely loud. In fact, I'd even tried out for that pom-pom squad, and I didn't even make it. See, I was a farm girl who grew up driving tractors, cleaning out those pig pens, and riding my horseback through the woods. The biggest tragedy that I remember was that I didn't make that pom-pom squad those years ago. But I was drawn into, during my college years, I was drawn into the world's way of living. Dating meant sex, sex was expected, and I had no understanding of what that meant. So boom, surprise, I found myself pregnant. So as a young, vulnerable, clueless woman looking for answers, I turned to Planned Parenthood. They failed on so many levels, not informing me of the baby's development, indicating it was a blob of tissue like we've heard many times here, an inconvenience and it was easily discarded, offering their surface their services as an easy solution to my unplanned pregnancy, all easily accepted by me, as they were the yeah. medical professionals, right? Well, their counsel led to blind acceptance, and it became a perverted understanding of my future motherhood. I killed 
children, my two children, both of them were boys. And I wonder where would they be today? Would they be raising a family? Instead, there are empty chairs in businesses and in schools, and there's empty bleachers everywhere. But I can picture what it should look like. The bleachers would be full, my sons and their families and my grandchildren all making lots and lots of noise. And I'm not alone. There are many of us. We quietly live out our lives, but we never forget the enormous loss in our lives. A loss that's felt deeply on a larger scale as well in our towns, our state, and our country, and our nation. Through What's legalized that? abortion, we yeah, allow yeah. thousands of our children to be snuffed yeah. out each and every year. And wounded women are left to stumble through life, many of us unable and not equipped to fulfill that role as a mother. I humbly acknowledge and accept the responsibility of the decision that I made. It was wrong. It ended life and forever damaged the future. As our elected representatives, you may spend your careers dealing with complex issues relating to improving our country for the living. They're all good and they're well intended, but they're absolutely useless for the lifeless. So I ask all of us to stand for the right to life because abortion hurts me and the abortion industry does not represent me. Thank you. Hello, my name is Nona Ellington. I'm from Houston, Texas. It is such an honor to be here. Wow. The abortion industry does not represent me. I was 15 years old in 1983 in the 10th grade in high school and as a victim of date rape, became pregnant. I went to Planned Parenthood to get a free pregnancy test to confirm that I was pregnant. They told me that at five weeks of pregnancy, it was only a blob of tissue and that I could have an abortion since I was so young and still in school. No other options were given to me. After speaking with my sister and friends at school, I decided to have an abortion. Since they told me it was really no big deal, people do it all the time, especially since you're still in school. I was thinking how terrible it would be to go to school pregnant. I was covered with shame and guilt even before the abortion took place. When I told my ex-boyfriend that I was pregnant and needed money for an abortion, he denied that he was the father, which deepened my shame. Around October 1983, my mom and sister took me to an abortion facility. My mom, like me, knew nothing about what an abortion did to a baby or a woman. My mother had nine children. She didn't even have a clue. The only thing I knew about the abortionist was that he was a man. There was no doctor-patient relationship. You see a theme here. The abortion was extremely painful and it felt like my insides were being ripped out. I had never even been to a gynecologist. There was no follow-up care offered. Soon after I became more involved in drugs, alcohol, and promiscuous sex, I was spiritually void, rebelling against my Christian upbringing. I became emotionally numb with no regard for living at all. I married a man that was already That's abusing me. Good. As a result of low self-esteem, I attempted suicide. As a result of recurring depression by cutting myself. Abortion ruined all chances of having children. I suffered five miscarriages during my marriage of 18 years, which ended in divorce. Three of them were tubal pregnancies. 
requiring emergency surgery and very near death experiences. The last one in 2004, my tube actually ruptured and they almost lost me and had to give me blood transfusions. I so much wanted to have a baby. I battled breast cancer in 2014. Research has proven that abortion can cause breast cancer. I had the genetic testing done proving I am not a carrier of the breast cancer gene. So I am totally convinced it was a result of the abortion. Abortion was the most selfish decision I ever made in my whole life, even though I was coerced into it. It affected everyone in my life, caused devastation to my mind, soul, and body, but there is healing for broken hearts after abortion. Through the love and forgiveness of Jesus Christ, and forgiving ourselves when we receive that forgiveness. His work at the cross of Calvary removes all shame, bitterness, self-hatred, and sin if we believe and ask for his forgiveness and receive it. It is my desire to reach the nations with a message that abortion hurts women, lives, and families. This is why I will be silent no more. I'm Cecilia Sullivan from Florida. Thank you. I was 17 when I became pregnant. Because of fear of what my parents would do and fear of the future, I waited five months to tell my mother. She arranged for me to have a saline abortion at Bellevue Hospital in Manhattan. On the day of the procedure, I was dropped off at the hospital. I was not given any counseling or, to or told about the development of my baby or what the abortion would be like. I was taken to a room where the technician proceeded to insert a six, ni six inch needle into my womb. It burnt as the warm liquid went into my body, the saline solution that would burn my baby's body and kill him. I went through hours of labor and delivery by myself and gave birth to my baby. It was a baby boy. After the abortion, my life spiraled into a life of drugs, alcohol, and promiscuity. I was trying to fill the emptiness that was growing in me. I hated myself so and what I had the, become. Uh, I had such a low self-esteem, I thought I didn't deserve better, a better here. life. Very I good. had three more good. abortions. Sound is awesome. is good. Mm -hmm. Abortion Thanks had become that. a form of birth control. Uh, After all, it was only a blob of tissue. Well, yeah, should, or so they told me. To okay. Each time, I felt like my life was being sucked out of me. I felt dead inside, empty. I wanted to die. I was never counseled, told about fetal development, or given any other option. I never saw the abortionist before or after the procedure. There was no aftercare and no follow-up. I suffered years of pain and regret because of my abortions. Four of my children were never given a chance to fulfill their destiny. Generations lost. I also had two miscarriages. and I as a result of the abortions. My freedom of choice robbed me and my family of life. I lived a life of self-destruction until the love of Jesus Christ brought forgiveness, healing, and restoration to my life and my family. I went through a healing program and was finally able to forgive myself and be free from guilt and shame. I now have three living daughters and six grandchildren by the grace of God. <laughs> Amen. Abortion hurts women, men, and children. It hurts families. Abortion is the cause of much pain and suffering in our nation. We must speak out and not be silent to expose the lies of abortion. It is time for the truth to be heard and healing to begin in our nation and in the millions of women that have been hurt by abortion. Amen. Thank you. Ashley and I'm from Louisiana and my abortion did hurt me. I'm here today sharing my story because I don't want any woman to be wounded and forsaken by the abortion industry like I was. 
Admitting privileges won't save children, but it could save the lives of women. I was 18, promiscuous, and I became pregnant by my boyfriend who was just as lost as I was. I immediately reacted out of fear and scheduled my abortion. The Louisiana abortion facility that I spoke to put me on the schedule and called in a pill for me to take so that I would be partially drugged prior to the procedure. I was told that I had to take that pill prior to having the abortion performed. I arrived in the waiting area and was seated with other girls just like me, unable to look up or make eye contact. Without any form of counseling or doctor-patient relationship, I entered the room for the procedure. As the abortionist entered, he nonchalantly confirmed the pregnancy on the ultrasound screen and said, look, there it is, just like it was nothing, offering for me to look. Unfortunately, because of being drugged, just out of pure reaction, I saw my baby there inside of my womb. And I also watched as she was suctioned from my womb. When people say it's my body, it most certainly is not merely that. It was my baby. Before I knew what to think, it was over. I was given a prescription for a pill to take that night, asked to get dressed, and left. There was no pre or post procedure visit, physical examination, or support offered. Immediately, I was filled with anger and shame. That led to me becoming very guarded and rebellious, and my world began to revolve around these words. Years later, after getting married to my amazing and understanding husband, I suffered three miscarriages. I felt as though I was being punished for my previous mistake, and that's when I began to see a big difference in health care when the same scenario was encountered, but from two very different perspectives. Unlike the abortionist, my doctor, who cared for me before and after my miscarriages in DNC, medically counseled me, she explained physical details to me, and even called me from her cell phone the next day to check on me. Why should the care from a spontaneous abortion differ from the care of an induced abortion? Shouldn't both women receive optimal health care? As you can see, my experiences were vastly different. My doctor who performed my DNC has hospital admitting privileges. In order to obtain this, physicians must present proof of training for their scope of practice to a credentialing committee. A radiologist or an ophthalmologist, as in one of our Louisiana abortion facilities, would never receive hospital privileges to perform gynecological procedures. And yet, how is it in women's interest to have physicians in a clinical setting perform operations for which they have received no formal training in facilities which have no standards of care. Is that truly women's health care? I'm asking the Supreme Court to ensure that Louisiana has the right to protect women from shoddy abortion practices. As a licensed nurse practitioner who works in the surgical setting, I daily advocate for patients with the goal of connecting them to their operating physicians to ensure their comfort, safety, and well-being. Why should women who are choosing to end the life of their baby be given any less of a standard of care? Thank you. My name is Lisa Stribling, and I'm from Kansas City, Missouri. And I want to start today by saying it is a privilege to be here, and abortion does hurt women. I have five dead children, and it is because of the abortion uh, industry crime against humanity. When I say that number to people, a lot of times I hear gasps at the number. But what I would like to say is I have heard before that why gasp at five when you don't gasp at one? What difference does the number make? When I was 27 years old, after living working. a life of crime sorry, and drug addiction, I was sent to the Missouri I'm Penitentiary. And when I went to the penitentiary, I was four months pregnant. Oh, yeah, and I sure. went in and I did my time. And as I was doing my time, I began to develop in my pregnancy. And when I was seven and a half months pregnant, they sent me to the doctor, the local doctor. And they did a sonogram. And without giving me any information, they called the doctor in and they said, there's something wrong. She's pregnant with twins. The doctor who spoke very broken English 
said to me, come to the room. He said, today your babies will die. He said they will not live. He didn't give me any options. He didn't give me any explanation. He told the prison system to get ready to send me down the road to the hospital in another part of the city. They chained me up. They put belly chains around my big tummy and shackles on my feet. And they put me in the car and they sent me down to the hospital. The first thing that they did is they put my foot, uh, a log chain around my foot and they chained me to the bed. They started the late induction, late term induction abortion, which took three and a half days to have. As I was laying there in the bed waiting for that uh, abortion to, to be finalized, the entire time I was chained to the bed. The only time I was ever unchained is if I had to get up and, and use the restroom. As I was chained to that bed, I laid there and I had no choice in the matter. The babies were born and I was a day later sent back to the prison. I went back to the prison and shortly thereafter, and I wanna assure you that as I started my abortion journey of having five dead children and four abortions, I was 100% pro-choice, 100%. But this experience completely, completely wrecked me and changed my stance. When I went back to the prison, shortly thereafter, I became very, very ill, very, very ill. I had no conversation with any doctor. I had no conversation about a follow-up after a seven and a half month uh, late-term abortion. I had no uh, doctor-patient uh, relationship. I went into that prison and I became very, very ill. They sent me to the prison infirmary as I began to bleed and I had a very high fever and I was becoming sicker and sicker. And what happened is she put me on the table. And a little while I was bleeding. And after a little while longer, I was greatly bleeding where I began to pass flesh the size of football. She began to scream knowing she didn't have time for an ambulance. They brought a prison car across the yard. They chained me up again and I had blood from my head to my toes as I laid there in hemorrhage. They put me in the car and they took me back to the hospital uh, where the original doctor uh, sent me away and told me I would have my abortion. I had my, uh, my uh, abortion there at the other hospital, but now I'm back at the original hospital. That doctor looked at me, he put his hands up in the air, he said, not my fault. Not my fault, do not blame me, not my fault. I could barely hear him or uh, understand what he was saying as he was saying this to me. They chained me back up and they finished what was not completed at the hospital where the abortion was performed. As I did the rest of my time, I mourned uh, greatly as I went to the doctor that day and found out I was pregnant with twins. I also went to the funeral of my twins the very same week. There was a lot of emotion, four abortions, five dead children. I had four living children at home. As I got home, the first thing I did is I made an appointment with a doctor who I did not know. And I said, make it so I can never get pregnant again, ever. I was so traumatized by that experience as those babies were actually born alive and died shortly thereafter. I was so traumatized by that experience. I did not want to have nothing to do ever again with being pregnant. I do want to say though, as I end, that I am here with my husband who has went the journey with me and we have been here together for 40 years and that Abortion does hurt women, but I would like to say that the men are hurt just as much. And I go around repenting to the men for women saying, my body, my choice, because it is not just our choice. We have hurt the men in America. And I wanna say that I repent on behalf of women to the men 
as well that we have never given them a choice i never gave my husband the choice when i went and had a tubal ligation i didn't give him the choice at all in any of it i did it the way i wanted to do it but when i was in that prison nobody gave me the choice thank you same stories, different voices, different faces. Um, I, I don't know why, I guess I can understand now as I'm with all you voices that God allowed me to go through. I don't want to see my face. God, I'm okay. Uh, God allowed me to see it all. I don't, and now I understand. I, um, I specialized in ultrasound soon after it was invented. That gives my age away, over 35 years. But I've witnessed and experienced the lies, deceit, and complications of abortion, both personally and with my patients and friends. The abortion industry continues to violate the standard medical practice that jeopardized the health and safety of women and failed to provide factual information, just basic information I think it's that we all give in the medical community of informed battery. consent. I I have another cord in my bag. Ultrasound and the testimonies of post-abortive women provide the greatest evidence to prove that abortion takes the life of an innocent human being and hurts women and families. I personally experienced the lies of incompetent doctors that almost took my life and infertility. infertility. This is a crazy story, almost unbelievable, but it started while I was a virgin. I was attacked by a man, but got away, but suffered a severe UTI infection from his hand. I told my mother. My mother took me to the doctor. The doctor lied and told her I was pregnant and set up an abortion in California before it was legalized. I, I pray, I cried, I cried. I said, Mom, believe me, he didn't get near me. But she believed the doctor and the abortion appointment was set. But fortunately, one day before the plane was scheduled to leave, my period came and I was so relieved because now my mom would believe me. But the doctor lied again and told her I miscarried. And from that day forward, it severed the relationship between me and my mother. And we were not able to restore that relationship until a month before she died at 80 years old. And then I went ahead to college and I became that carefree, promiscuous woman that I was accused of being when I was totally innocent. My period was late. It was in 1974, and I went to the doctor on my lunch hour. He told me it was too early to confirm that the pregnancy was positive, but we could just do a menstrual extraction just to assure if you are pregnant that we got all the contents out of your uterus. I didn't know this. In 1974, he was performing back alley abortions, and he performed the same procedure that he did in the back alleys on me that day. He had a a jar, a tube, and a 50C syringe. And three nurses held me down as I screamed in excruciating pain. I went home, suffered severe complications, returned to the hospital only to be greeted by the same doctor to perform the procedure again. I never was confirmed that it was even positive. They lie. I might not have even been pregnant but I suffered severe complications. But I didn't feel guilt because it wasn't a baby, so I continued my carefree lifestyle. And when I came, became pregnant two years later, I was told I was nine weeks. And this time, I made sure that I got a professional doctor who gave me pain. I didn't have any complications after that abortion. And you know, rea the reality, I didn't feel any guilt because I became hard and cold. I liked this new me because nobody was going to hurt me again until 
1978, that wall came crashing down, and I was told I was pregnant again, but I was bleeding, so I waited for a miscarriage. It didn't happen, so I went to the doctor. He said I was too far along to do an abortion at his facility. So let's get an ultrasound, maybe you have twins. I said, I can't be more than 10 weeks. I only had one relationship. He goes, well, maybe you've had twins. Your mom was a twin. So they confirmed with the ultrasound that I was seven months pregnant, but I wasn't pregnant with a baby. I was pregnant with this hydatidiform mole that's conceived as a normal pregnancy, possibly a long-term complication. And he said, don't worry about it. I'm going on vacation, we'll take care of it when I get back. It should have been an emergency intervention. Fortunately, I was working as an x-ray tech in the hospital. Got severe cramping, went to the restroom, and this tumor, massive blood, ruptured, and they found me in a pool of blood in the bathroom. They saved my life because I was in that hospital that day. If I wasn't there, I would not be here given my testimony. They gave me a blood transfusion, opened me up and said, it's full of cancer, choriocarcinoma. Called my mom to sign off for a total hysterectomy. My mom said, no, she's too young, I'm gonna get another opinion. And thank God the second opinion showed that they got all the cancer out, but I could never have a child because my uterus had perforated and it wouldn't bear the weight of a normal pregnancy. So on with life I went, I tried to build, I built the wall up again, that really works well. It was real thick by then until I went into ultrasound school. And I saw that the nine week so-called blob of tissue that I aborted was a baby with moving and, and jumping. And then I couldn't have that baby anymore. I was told I couldn't have children. And then I went into ultrasound and they told me to lie to women again, to turn the monitors away from women considering abortion because it just might influence her choice when they see that moving image moving around. And I said, no way, I'm not lying. They lied to me all these years, I'm not lying. And I saved a lot of babies and women would Jesus. say, why aren't they telling us? Jesus. And then I tried to get forgiveness. I didn't know a guy could forgive me. And as a last resort, I went to a beach and I'll never forget this. I cried out to a God that I didn't know and I said, if you are real, I need to find you. And I asked him to heal my womb, to use my testimony to help other women so they didn't have to feel the five years of pain and guilt. The worst thing you can have to carry is knowing the truth of ultrasound and not knowing God's forgiveness. And that's what I carried five years. I wanted to kill myself. And then I asked him to use my ultrasound show the world that these are babies and that month i conceived the first of my three miracle pregnancies and then a couple years later my first speaking engagement was right over there before the united states senate showing that these are babies and they didn't want to hear the truth and then he took my ultrasound around the world but my story is complicated. It's almost totally unbelievable, but God is good, and I'm so thankful you all are here. I suffered breast cancer. I, um, the latest is, and I'm just gonna be honest, I'm sick and tired of the incompetency that we're seeing in the hospitals, and it just happened again. Less three months ago, incompetent doctors took the life of my grandbaby at nine months because they avoided placenta abruption and waited over three hours for the doctor to get there to open her up and do a c-section we almost lost her so we cannot be silent no more thank you i have uh, just a quick a comment and thought that i feel it's really important as the industry wants to advocate for safe, safe legal abortion, I have a question for them. When is pulling a child limb by limb in utero ever safe? There is no such thing as safe when somebody is dying. So I just wanted to say that. 
I am here, it's a privilege to uh, share with you Terry Baxter's story. She is from Kansas City, Missouri, and she is not able to be here today, but we wanted her story to be heard. Um, she is having uh, surgery, and she's, begin she's still reaping the consequences of her choices from her abortion experience, as you're gonna hear in her story, so. Terry says, I was in college, excited to be free and on my own. I met a man of my young dreams and we dated for four years. Then one day I found myself pregnant and scared. A baby was not in my plans for college, fun or freedom. Because my boyfriend didn't want children, he suggested abortion. I started believing the lies in my head and abortion probably is the best option because you know you don't want to embarrass your family no one ever has to know and since it's legal how could it be so wrong i don't remember many details of the day i went to the clinic but i do remember the silence and the fear in the waiting room i do remember no one mentioning in the counseling room of possible physical or emotional risks that could be consequences of my abortion. I will never forget the sounds of the machine swirling like a vacuum cleaner during my abortion experience. There was pain and then it was over. So I thought, I started bleeding heavily just a few nights after my abortion. It really frightened me and I had no clue what to do. There were no mention of follow-up care it was late after hours and I couldn't call the abortion clinic. I felt so alone and frightened. I went to my boyfriend for help, but he just said I was wor worrying about too much. Another guy saw me in tears and offered to help. He took me to the college infirmary and they treated me for an infection from the abortion. I decided never to mention my abortion that time in my life again to anyone. I felt so alone, realizing I had to keep it hidden in my heart. No one would ever understand my brokenness. I was diagnosed with breast cancer at age 39, and as I answered the related reproductive questions, I was able to say no to all but one. Have you had an abortion? I lied. I said no to that one because I was still silently carrying my secret. It was after my recovery from breast cancer that I started learning about the link between abortion and breast cancer, the increased risks. I was cancer free for 24 years until just recently when I was diagnosed again. Why didn't the doctors or the staff warn me of what the possibilities of my future would hold? How nine months of treatment would change me physically and emotionally. This included chemotherapy, which tore me down as my red hair came out in clumps and the tears I had shed at this point, as this is part of a woman's identity. Of the day, or, or of the days that I had no energy to get dressed or to talk to anyone. They could have warned me of the physical changes and how hard the decisions I had to make regarding my mastectomy. I will never physically return to who I was just months ago. Only through the grace of God and healing emotionally from the regrets and lies of abortion am I able to go forward in faith that God is still in control. Because he lives, I too can face tomorrow. I am convinced, Terry says, now more than ever, that my cancer is a consequence of my abortion. I had the genetic testing done, and I do not, she says, carry that gene. I feel this could have been prevented if only if only, I've heard that a lot today, if only the doctors truly cared and carried out their oath to do no harm and had given me the truth 
about my options and the risks. Though I have been forgiven, Terry says, I am no longer broken emotionally. However, my choice continues to hurt me even after 45 years later. And on behalf of Terry Baxter, thank you so much for listening. I was 15, my thoughts were not on what was about to happen, but of missing cheerleading practice. The room was filled with many girls, and to my mom's dismay, we saw someone we knew. I sat in a room waiting for my name to be called, just like any other doctor's appointment, but this was like no other. They said it won't hurt. It did. They said it would be over real quick. It's lasted 42 years. I'm Joyce Zunas Brown from Denver, Colorado. I lay on that abortion table looking at everything but the machine by my side. The abortionist told me if I ever see you in public, don't acknowledge me. The room was filled with noise, much like a vacuum cleaner, then silence. Okay, we're almost done. Take a deep breath. He said as I looked over and watched my baby go through a clear tube, I froze in a trance-like state. The baby I denied became real and was now dead. I'll never forget that day. I felt everything. I felt nothing. 11 years after my first abortion, I was having my seventh. I was in the same waiting room, walking the same hall, wearing the same gown, taking the same pill, and laying on the same table. To this abortionist discussed, I was further along I was 12 weeks pregnant and I was going to require more of his time that day and interfere with his golfing tea time. Several hours later, after the laminaria took, the vacuum cleaner like noise broke me from a decade old trance. What have I done? I began to weep uncontrollably. And to this enraged doctor, his gestures were rough. He was pleased for me to see his bloody garments. And when he was finished, the nurse quickly moved me to the recovery room, gave me the same crackers, and within 10 minutes, I was out the back door, nauseous on my way home. 11 years, three clinics, two states, seven abortions, and not once was there a relationship with a doctor or with any type of aftercare for my abortions. I was never told of the physical risk I would suffer later, fear of breast cancer, the necessity of bilateral mammograms, ovarian cysts, having to be bedridden in my last final 12th pregnancy, and having to explain the possibility of mommy dying to my four young children due to placenta previa, which resulted in my losing all but two pints of blood and a partial hysterectomy at delivery. I just recently learned if you hold a can of Coke, pour out half of it, that's our blood and mouth that would cause us to die. 50 gauzes later from that abortion I lived. I was not told of the emotional risk I would suffer, destructive behavior. I was a crazy woman. I hid behind the mask of my shame. Everything's okay. Abandonment issues, everything's okay. And I was one mad lady for about 10 years. In these 11 years, I was never told of my mental health or how my five living children would suffer an impossible mom trapped by the sadness of her gullible past. Coming to terms with my choices, no one else's, just mine. The tormenting pain, disconnection, dismay that followed had become all consuming. Thank you, Jesus. Through divine intervention in 1990, I participated in an abortion recovery program. I was able to face and be released from my secret sorrow. And finally, I was able to grieve my seven boys, Michael Daniel, Glenn Jr., Greg, Christopher, Charlie, Jennings, and Demetrius. Before dying 10 years ago, my mom joined me in telling others 
we were wrong. Abortion was not the right answer and is forever our deepest regret. Abortion hurts families, friends, and our future generations. And I stand here for tomorrow, just as written behind me on our U.S. Supreme Court building, for equal justice under law, equal justice for our babies. Thank you. My name is Sheila Harper, and I'm the president and founder of a nonprofit organization called Save One. And what we do is we help men, women, and families recover after abortion. I had an abortion on March 29, 1985, and it was by far the most regrettable mistake of my entire life. I had no idea that I, what I thought was going to fix a problem was really just opening many more problems in my life. I went that day not knowing what to do. I was so confused and I was so scared at 19 years old. But I justified this decision by thinking that the Supreme Court okayed this. They made it legal, so it must be okay. But I knew in my heart and in my gut that something wasn't right about this. It didn't feel right. But I kept thinking, the Supreme Court knows more than me, so it must be okay. And I understand now that they've been wrong before and they were wrong in 1973. And so I went that day and I signed in and gave a fake name. Nobody asked for an ID or anything like that. I gave a fake name and they told me I would be called back for counseling. And so when I heard that word, I was so excited because I thought counseling, that's what I needed. It was like this incredible idea. I had not thought of that before, so I thought, okay, counseling, an adult is going to give me an alternative, something better I could be doing than having an abortion on this day. And so I, I, when I caught, called back for counseling, I walked into a dreadful office with a dreadful woman sitting there. And I burst into tears because I thought, okay, this is my opportunity. I'm going to have counseling. I can tell somebody. She said this, do you want to have this abortion? I said, I don't know any other choice through my sobbing. And so she wrote on a little white card, the number two, and she handed it to me and said, then go sit down out there and we'll call your number in a moment. So then we were just a number. We didn't even go by the fake name anymore. So I went into a room and I sat down. There was one other girl in there. We, by the time they started calling our numbers, the entire room was filled with girls. And when I say filled, every arm of every chair had a girl sitting there. There were, there were girls lined around the walls. There were girls sitting on the floor waiting for their abortions. So they called number one, then they called number two, and I had to make my way into that room. It was absolutely painful, the worst pain I have ever felt in my life. I could hardly walk after the surgery. I got up and tried to walk and they, they helped me and helped me walk into the recovery room. The recovery room was a room filled with beanbag chairs. This is, this is I'm not exaggerating, the, that was the recovery room. They laid me down in a recovery chair, which that's what they called, but it was a beanbag chair in the corner of the room. I was able to see the entire room and I saw those girls coming into this new room that I saw earlier who were flipping through magazines and talking to each other and now they were coming into this room and that nobody was looking at each other. Nobody was catching each other's eyes everybody who came in that room was crying and I remember laying there and watching these girls come into that room one by one after the, their abortions and I remember thinking we just got rid of our worst problem but why do I not feel better and so I went home and started dealing with this problem the best I could my life went off the rails I spent the next seven years becoming reliant upon drugs and alcohol just to get through the day. I attempted suicide during that time. I just wanted to die. And finally, after seven years of living that way, I made my way. I found, fortunately, through a pregnancy center who gave me true care. 
they offered a, a Bible study much like the one Save One offers now. And I was able to go through that Bible study and get my life back. It, it, through Jesus Christ, through His blood, He covered me and I was able to realize that I can be forgiven for the sin of abortion and I can walk free from this. Ever since that day, I have not been able to be quiet about what is going on. I refuse to allow my brothers and sisters to be led to the slaughter and believe the same lie that I, li that I believed. And so the, I know that the, the scriptures tell us that by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony, we will overcome the enemy. So we win in the end. We win. It is by these stories that we make a difference. I'm so thankful for all of you being here. I'm thankful for you, Georgette. And I'm so thankful for the people who are not willing to be silent. Thank you. I have been given the very somber privilege and honor to read a story. And this is Justice for Laura as told by mother, Ellen Smith. All she needed was air. It was 7 p.m. and my recently engaged daughter was calling my husband's cell phone. We loved hearing from Laura. She always lifted your spirits just by talking to her. Except this time it wasn't her voice. There was a screaming and sobbing on the other end by a voice I did not rec immediately recognize. I heard the word abortion. It was Laura's friend Karen on the phone. She told me what happened, that Laura was having an abortion and something went terribly wrong. Karen was at the OR and the doctor needed to talk to me. What Karen didn't know was that Laura had arrived at the ER already deceased. The EMTs found her this way at the abortion mill. All she needed was air. My beautiful daughter, whom we had adopted at age five, was a gift that we didn't ask for. Laura's gone, the ER, ER doctor told me. All hope was gone, along with my precious girl. I didn't even know she was pregnant. That day, I lost my 13-year-old grandchild to abortion and my 22-year-old daughter to the lack of medical care. All she needed was oxygen. While laying on the table, still sedated from the anesthesia, she began to cough, struggling for her life. And instead of helping her, this doctor administered more drugs. All she needed was air. The doctor-owned abortion mill did not have an anesthesiologist, a crash cart, resuscitate apparatus, nor CPR knowledge. Among its small staff of one doctor, receptionist, and a handholder. Nor did the doctor have any admitting privileges to a local hospital. He falsified his insurance policy. Ten days after Laura's death, I met with this man who saw my daughter take her last breath. We met in a Boston hotel lobby, surrounded by gr the gaiety of a wedding celebration. And here I was waiting for the man who killed my daughter. What contrast. What irony. Who was I was supposed to be picking out the mother of the bride's dress was now picking out a tombstone. All she needed was air. The substandard conditions at the abortion, the abortion mill were the choice of the doctor. As an educated Harvard fellow, he did not do what he did out of ignorance. He teaches Harvard classes on sedation for OBGYN patients. He knew what to do, but he did not do it. All she needed was air. As we waited for Laura's autopsy report, which took five and a half months, the doctor tried to cover up his responsibility for Laura's death. He had his employees lie for him in affidavits. He remodeled the office, brought in all the safety equipment, to his office and made it look like it was always there. It was a show for the medical board. Due to the honesty of one of his employees, these lies were exposed. I kept pressure on the DA and when the results came out from the autopsy, it confirmed my greatest fear and suspicion. The doctor was responsible for Laura's death 
and the crime that was committed against my daughter. All she needed was air. He lost his medical license forever in February of 08, and his abortion mill was closed. I thank God that he could never take the, another life at his mill again. It took a total of three years to get justice for Laura. The medical board case took only five months, and the civil criminal case both settled on the same day on September 3rd, 2010, the third anniversary of Laura's death. The fight for injustice for Laura is over. My fight for all the lives of the unborn children has only begun. All they need is air. Laura Hope Smith, May 25th, 1985 to September 13th, 2007. My name is Mary Browning, and I had an abortion when I was 18. The father of our baby did not want the baby, and I didn't want my family and my community and my fiance to reject me because I had had sex outside of marriage. It wasn't his fault. I participated in it, but I just want to say, if the man that was the father of the child had not wanted it, I would have never considered it. And the fact that it was legal. We cut our honeymoon short so I could have the abortion. Five days after we were married, I went in to see the doctor. I'd never met him before. He didn't give me any options. He didn't give me an exam. He didn't talk about how developed the baby was, and he didn't he didn't really seem to understand the magnitude of what was going to happen. When he started the procedure, I dissociated. I believe that was from the trauma, the physical and emotional trauma of what was happening. I watched the abortion from the ceiling and could see the doctor between my legs. I didn't feel any pain. I had believed that my baby was a blob of tissue, but it wasn't. After the procedure was over, the doctor was mad at me. He said the baby was 16 weeks old. He had relied on my guesstimation as to when my last cycle was and had assumed the baby was 12 weeks old. So I think what actually happened was an illegal abortion because it was not legal at that point in Missouri beyond 12 weeks. He did have hospital admitting privileges but he and I had no relationship. I tried to put the knowledge of what I had done behind me, but, it, but the past plagued me and it is always present. I found help when I confided in a friend. He had also had an experience about abortion. Nine years after the abortion, I accepted the forgiveness that is offered by a loving and forgiving God for those of us that fail. I have wondered through the years what my child would look like. What would he have done? What, would his, what was he meant to accomplish? That marriage was not successful. It was fraught with emotional abuse and physical abuse, and my husband was an alcoholic. If I had not begun that marriage compromising my values, would it have been different? I have had a string of broken relationships and it's very hard for me to trust men. It wasn't until I was writing my story that I under began to understand how these things could be connected. While I was married, I did have two daughters. My oldest was a little yes, less than a year old when I started college. And both my girls uh, were four and eight when I got my law license. I felt like we grew up together, but there was one of us that was missing, their full sibling. In my professional career, I have been a staunch advocate for children, particularly those that have been abused and neglected. I have worked on legislation to protect children, and I have been the chair of our state child fatality review panel. I am now fully aware that the child abuse didn't start after birth. 
I am so thankful for Jesus and his mercy, paying the price for my sins. I hope talking about my experience will help others who have lived with the shame and the remorse of participating in taking a life through abortion. Friends, we have heard two hours of testimony here today and two dominant themes have come across one abortion harms women kills their babies and that's the first way actually that it harms them but it harms these mothers in countless other ways the fathers the siblings the grandparents the entire family our whole society that's the first theme we just heard but there's a second theme that you heard Repeat it over and over again, and I just want to say a word about this because it impacts this case. You heard over and over again, there was no doctor-patient relationship. I, this was not my physician. This was a stranger. And furthermore, he or she, the abortionist, did not have my best interests at heart. He or she harmed me disrespected me, abused me. Now why is that important? Because the case that we are here to advocate for, the case that this court will hear arguments in tomorrow, the June Medical Services case, was brought to the Supreme Court by the abortionists. The Louisiana law that's being defended here that, that pr protects the health of, of mothers was upheld by the Federal Court of Appeals, the Fifth Circuit. It was upheld. And then the abortion facility and a couple of individual abortionists said, no, that's not good enough for us. We're going to the Supreme Court. They have come to this court pretending to speak for the women of Louisiana and by extension women around the country who want to have abortions. Not one single woman from Louisiana has come to the court and said this law is bad, strike it down, it doesn't help us, in fact it hurts us. Not one! And yet these abortionists claim as they come to this court with this case, that they are speaking for these women. They claim that, oh, well, we are representing them. And the only way, understand this, the only way that the, the law, okay, and the procedures that govern this court allow them to stand in for somebody else is two things. Number one, if that somebody else can't come and speak for themselves, which there's absolutely no evidence that the women of Louisiana can't come here and speak for themselves. But the other provision of the law is that they have to have a close relationship with the person that they're claiming to represent at the court. Not only is there not a close relationship between these moms, many of whom have testified right now, and these abortionists. Not only is there not a close relationship, there is no relationship at all. In fact, there is an adversarial relationship. These abortionists care nothing for these mothers. Do not respect them. Absolutely have contempt for them. In fact, in our work through Priests for Life, we work with a lot of ex-abortionists. Do you know that they have told me that in doing the procedure, some of these abortionists have told me that they used to do the procedure in a way that caused more pain than was necessary precisely because they couldn't stand women. And you think this is an exception? Don't think for a moment that this is an aberration. This is the norm. Brothers and sisters, uh, let's let's pray for those that have given their testimony here today those that through the silent no more campaign and you can see more of these testimonies at silentnomore.com 
and abortiontestimonies.com have given uh, upon these individuals heal their wounds, give voice to their tongues, let their testimonies spread throughout this nation, throughout the world, let those testimonies penetrate the minds and hearts of our fellow citizens and awaken their conscience to the evil of abortion. And let those testimonies, Lord, that have actually been submitted to this court in this case, in formal documents, let those testimonies have an impact on these justices as they deliberate on this case. And Lord, we pray for the justices. You know, friends, every, every seat in that court, the nine chairs that the justices sit in when they hear cases, every one of them is a different size. Because they literally make these chairs custom made for the, the, the height of that justice. And that reminds us as we pray for them, that just as each chair is tailor-made for the justice to sit comfortably in it. So our prayers now for them are tailor-made. Lord, you know that each one of these, these nine justices has a different need. Lord God, send them the specific graces, the specific insights that they need to judge rightly. Lord, some of these justices are so on the right track. They are as pro-life as we are. And Lord, we ask you to strengthen them as we ask you to strengthen us. Give clarity to their minds, vigor to their spirits, courage to their hearts, perseverance to their souls, protection to their bodies. And let their voice come vigorously from this court on behalf of life and on behalf of these mothers who are wounded. On the other hand, Lord, there are some of these justices Lord God, they need repentance. Lord God, they need hard hearts made tender again. Darkened minds made light again. Dead consciences given life again. Some of these justices, Lord, they really don't belong on this court because they are not judging justly. They are not judging rightly. They are not even respecting the constitution of this nation. They're destroying it. Lord God, bring light and repentance to them. Lord Jesus, send your Holy Spirit. Father, send the Holy Spirit from you and the Son. And send that Spirit too upon us. We all know Spirit of the living God. Let's sing Spirit of the living God. Fall afresh on us, first of all, because we come here repenting of our own sins. And then let's sing, Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on them, the justices of this court, and their clerks, and their staff, and the attorneys that will be arguing tomorrow on behalf of Louisiana, on behalf of these women. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us spirit of the living god fall afresh on us melt us mold us fill us use us Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us. And let's extend our hands to the court. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on them. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on them melt them mold them fill them use them spirit of the living god fall afresh on them. The Lord 
be with you. May the blessing and the Spirit of Almighty God come upon you now and forever. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, friends, I'm going to go head over to the National uh, Press Club. There's going to be a press conference there in a little while. But prayer and worship will continue here. And I think we have uh, an announcement to that effect. Uh, Mark Repke has been responsible here for the sound and the equipment. Mark, great job as usual. Thank you so much.